Um, so that people in the audience know who we are, can we go around and introduce ourselves? Yep. My name is Nina Hops, and I am the representative of Friends of the Library. I'm Charlie Arnton. I'm the Borough Assembly representative. Jack Finnegan, liaison for the Ketchikan City Council. Grant Echohawk, uh, member at large. June Dahl, chair. Sherry Montgomery, member at large. Uh, Sophia Pilgrim, team representative. Deborah Simon, borough resident. Uh, Kate Kovars, member at large. Yes, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are on Clinkett land and we would like to acknowledge and give honor and respect to the traditional landowners, the Clinkett elders and past, present and future generations. We honor the relationships that exist between Clinkett, Haida and Simshian peoples. Before we start talking freely, I'd like to just remind you we're here to talk about issues, not people. Uh, we can disagree. We don't have to be disagreeable. So play nice, folks. <laughs> And um, I would like to um, now discuss the approval of the agenda. Are there any corrections or additions? Motion to approve. Is that there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, would you read, uh, call the roll, Pat? Let's see. Let's see. Arnson. Yes. Echo Hawk. Yes. Finnegan. Yes. Bogart. Yes. Hawk. Yes. Montgomery. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Pilgrim. Yes. Simon. Yes. Oh. Agenda is approved. Uh, we have two sets of minutes to look at tonight. First, let's look at genuine. 2024. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Your Honor. I would um, move to approve the um, draft meeting minutes from January 10th, 2024. I'll second. Your Honor. Um, there was one note in here that I, there wasn't a, my vote was not um, acknowledged in the meeting okay. minutes. Okay. <clears throat> this is under section 12C. If we could get that uh, updated for the record. Great. See, in favor or opposed? I believe I voted opposed. Okay. Is there further, Deborah? On page three at the top, it says that I suggested a rating system. What I suggested was objective criteria for purchasing and shelving books. So we would cross out rating system and insert. However you want to say it, it was objective criteria for purchasing and shelving books. And where's this? On the top of page three. Okay, objective criteria? Yes. Okay. So Mrs. Simon suggests objective criteria for books? Yes. Further corrections? Are you ready for the motion? Yeah. The Echo Hawk. Yes. Finnegan. Yes. Govars. Yes. Hawks. Yes. Montgomery. Yes. Pilgrim. Yes. Simon. Yes. And Orange. Yes. Okay, next, the minutes of Tuesday, March 5th. Is there a motion for accept? Mm -hmm. 
I'll move to accept the meeting minutes from the organizational meeting of March 5th. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Any corrections? Additions? Okay. That would you call the roll? Finnegan. Yes. Dovar. Yes. Fox. Yes. Montgomery. Yes. Dover. Yes. Simon. Yes. Arnton. Yes. Echo Hawk. Yes. Motion carries. Next on the agenda is nominations and elections of a new chair. Um, the person elected will be taking over immediately. Uh, you can tell I'm a little eager. <laughs> uh, the way we have done this is according to Robert's rules of orders. Um, we take nominations from the floor and then we will consider those candidates in the order that they were uh, nominated. Um, for example, the first person who's nominated, if they get a majority vote, then that's the end of the election process. If that person doesn't get a majority vote, then we move on to the second person nominated. It seems kind of weird, but uh, actually, I guess it makes some sense. Uh, if you are nominated by someone else on the board, I will ask you if you accept the nomination. If you nominate yourself, um, I won't bother with that question. Uh, and please don't be shy. Um, are there any questions about that process? Okay, the nominations are open. Madam Chair, I'd like to nominate board member Grant Echohawk to serve as chair. I second that. Do you accept? I do. Oh, yes, do. Thank you. Are there other nominations? Your Honor, I'd yes. like to nominate myself for board chair. I'll second that. Any other nominations? Okay. Uh, Pat, would you call the roll? And this is to um, appoint Grant Echohawk as the chair. Let's see. <clears throat> okay. Uh, go bars. Can I pass? No. Fox? Yes. On Drummery? No. Pilgrim? Can I pass? Okay. Simon? No. Uh, Arnton? No. Echo Hawk? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. And going back to Govars? Yes. And Pilgrim? No. Okay. Okay. So it's a tie vote. Uh, Four yeas, four nays. Okay. Uh, one of the items uh, for discussion tonight is should the uh, chair be allowed to vote? Um, and we have so far been looking at Robert's Rules of Orders, which says that the chair can vote uh, in the case of a tie. And in that case, I vote yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so the yeas have it. So, uh, Grant Echo Hawk is, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm getting the old gavel. I don't plan to ever use a gavel. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she needs a bigger gavel. <laughs> it looks very dainty in this stand. <laughs> Okay, um, hold on, let me get myself situated. Okay, so it looks like we also have a nomination for uh, vice chair um, as well, right? So do we have any, uh, I assume we'll follow the same process. Uh, you can nominate someone else. I'll do the same thing. I'll ask if you accept the nomination or you can nominate yourself. Uh, and so do we have any nominations for vice chair? I'll nominate Charlie, please. Second. Okay. 
And Charlie, do you accept? I will. Thank you. Any other nominations? Great. Okay. And ready for the vote? Oh, see, Fox? Yes. Montgomery? Yes. Pilgrim? Yes. Simon? Yes. Arnson? Yes. Echo Hawk? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. I just wondering. Oh, that's right. Yes. <laughs> uh, Finnegan? Yes. Govars? Yes. And um, Dahl? Yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. Vice Chair Poynter, can you thank Al for the first time? <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, so now we're going to move on to item um, eight, which is public hearings on agenda item 12A. Uh, there's, a request, there's a request to move a book with copies in the children's and teens collection to the adult collection this one summer by Jillian and Mariko Tamako, or Tamaki, I'm sorry. Uh, after going through the consideration process, uh, we are ready to uh, hear uh, any correspondence and public comments on this uh, on this public hearing. Do we have any correspondence to start with? I see on the public hearing, uh, no. No. Nope. Oh, I, I went upstairs. upstairs. Okay. I can read it. Okay. Yeah. I don't have it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Board members, we did receive an email this evening from Cheryl Geisley. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not having to do with the book. It's a different comment. Oh, I apologize. Okay. Um, do I save it for, for the general? Yeah. yeah. Okay. See, so um, we have, uh, well, I, sh I, sh I should, yeah. Sure. We have no correspondence. No correspondence, thank you. Uh, then we'll go ahead and move into public comment. Uh, so public comment is uh, three minutes per speaker. And as Ms. Dahl already mentioned, um, be, be, feel free to talk about the issues, uh, but be, please be courteous, be polite, and remember we all, uh, we're all a community here, so um, we encourage anybody that uh, has signed up, um, uh, or I'm sorry, if once we go through a public comment, even if you didn't have a chance to sign up, there will be an opportunity for you to still speak. Okay, so uh, who do we have for public comment? Let's see, the first person on the list is Diane Littleperkins. Let's see. Hi, and thank you very for serving for each and every one of you. I'm sure it's okay for the past. So my name is Diane Liljegren. I've lived in Ketchikan since 1992, only a mother of an adult son. I would like to address the request to move this one summer, summer from the teen to the adult section of the library. This one summer has themes similar to previously requested book removals, including difficult family situations, teen pregnancy, suicide, and the physical changes of puberty. The book has some mild swearing, no worse than one could hear any day walking down the hallways of K-High. In this one summer, the two main characters are observers whom the book shows processing these troublesome episodes and supporting each other. This one summer also shows the young teen girls anticipating the bodily changes puberty will bring. Most teens do not live in the idyllic world of the Donna Reed show. Even if their family and social life is wholesome and happy, teens will be acquainted with fellow students who are dealing with the problems addressed in this one summer. Reading this graphic novel will validate and support the feelings of any teenager struggling with these issues. The subject matter is appropriate for teens, reflecting issues in their daily lives. This one summer should remain in the teen section. Books removed to the adult section are very hard for teens to find. Removal to the adult section is book banning light. It's becoming clear that the requests for relocations of teen books from the teen children's library are being made by people who do not want age-appropriate realism in teen books. Life can be really hard for kids. 
Reading about other kids in tough situations can help teens struggling with the difficulties all normal kids face in their lives. In this one summer, teen readers can see that they are not alone in their experiences and also see ways the protagonists cope with difficult situations. I feel like I'm in the movie Groundhog Day. A small group of people has repeatedly tried to make access to good books difficult for all Ketchikan teens. And this book is appropriate for teens and should be readily available to teens. Parents who fear their children reading such books can prohibit it. Community members should not try to limit appropriate book access for other people's children. I'm really sad that the library continues to receive requests to remove excellent books from the teen section, but I will continue to stand up for Ketchikan's First Amendment rights and free speech in the Rittenberg. Thank you all. Let's see, um, the next person who signed up is Heather Digger. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. I hate public speaking. Um, so I actually read the book this afternoon um, because I don't feel like anyone should speak on a book or a movie or any kind of anything that they haven't read themselves. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I don't read a lot of graphic novels. The illustrations were really beautiful and unique, and the way that they told the story was different than a lot of other graphic novels that I've seen. Um, I thought it was a great coming-of-age story, but I didn't feel like it was appropriate to be in the teen section. My own kids were visiting that section at 11, 12, 13 years old. If it were in the library at the high school, Feel differently, but there is a tween group that frequents that area, and I, I counted. I mean, I wasn't really thorough about it, but at least eighteen f bombs, in addition to other language. And if this were a movie, it would be rated R. You can have, I think, one, maybe two f words in a movie before it's rated R. I have teens. I also have a nine-year-old. PG thirteen is where we draw the line because there's in addition to language, just generally more adult, you know, subject matter that is a little bit harder to digest. I know that my teen has been checking out books from the adult section since he was 15. He's 18 now. He has absolutely no problem finding that. You go type it in, it tells you where it is. It's the same system in the adult library that it is in the teen library. It's literally like five, six steps away. I don't think that it adds a significant hardship to go over and you know as a teen i've been checking out books from the adult section since i was probably 13 and i knew that if i was venturing over there that it was going to be more mature subject matter and that if i stayed in the children's section or the teen section it was going to be less so so it was kind of what i was looking for at that time i don't agree with banning books i don't agree that this is a form of banning books i think that there are books that are appropriate for younger teens which the majority of the kids in the teen section are younger teens and not older teens, and that there are books that should be in a different section. And that was the last person you signed up. Great, thank you. Um, so, let's see, then, then for... So well, yes, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Okay, perfect. Um, and is there anyone else that would like to speak before we move on from this item? Floor is open. Yes. Can I speak even though I'm not public? Can I go speak? I'm not sure. Um, I believe we've allowed that in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that that's. Um, it has happened in the past. The right. person speaks as a private citizen. Right. But we will have a discussion among the board members. Okay. Do you want to? Would you like to to speak as a citizen yes. or as a board member? As a citizen. As a citizen. citizen. Okay. Before conversation here starts. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, so just if you could clarify when you're at the podium and just speaking just for your, on your own behalf. Yeah. Hi. My name is Sophia Pilgrim, and I'm speaking only for myself as a private citizen. Um, and I just wanted to come up here and give a little perspective as a teen. 
I read the book and I have a whole thing on my phone about it, but I don't think that this conversation is so formal as that. Um, reading this book, there were a couple things that I really wanted to point out that do happen to teens. And I think that reading this book at say 13, 14 might have actually helped me with some things. But there is specific dialogue in the book where the younger girls are seeing older boys say things about their girlfriends or the people that they are with. And these girls are realizing, oh, this is the language that teens use. And they, they say some of this stuff. And at one point, I think their mom says, we don't say that. We, that's a derogatory. We don't say that word. And they kind of have to have this moment of being, oh, not all the language that I hear should be repeated. And I, that is such a big point that I think a lot of teen books touch on, and it's, it's important. Because as a, as a middle schooler, hearing some of the things that were thrown around at Shelmar, I didn't know not to repeat it. It was language usually derogatory against women um, that I didn't know not to repeat. And at the, that age, middle school, high school, I started having those conversations with my mom. Why don't we say these words? What do these words mean? Realizing that some of my peers will use them, I should not, because I know the, the meaning and the depth behind them. And the book really talked about that in a way that I felt was important. Mm -hmm. I also think the talk of specifically the word boobs, I said it, um, the talk of that and the talk of changing in puberty, I think is honestly quite important. Maybe more specifically towards young women, because that's who the main characters are, they're female. But I, I think that the conversations about them were so lighthearted. It was in a way that, you know, people who don't fully realize that they're going through puberty and they're trying to make themselves feel comfortable about what's happening to their bodies. It was, it was, that was the conversation. And I feel like opening that conversation and saying, you know, you can talk about your body. You know, this is happening. Um, I, I honestly think that that was a good point. And I'm glad the book touched on it. I don't think that the use of those words was outlandish. I think that it was just a conversation between some growing teenagers, and I thought it was a good conversation. Um, I also, the topic of teen pregnancy comes up in the book, and I know that that is a topic that not all parents want their children to read about. That's understandable. But I think that it's an important topic, uh, especially because at K-High, for students who are 14 plus, there's the health class, and we talk about safe sex. We talk about not not anti-teen pregnancy, really. We talk about how to be safe, how not to let this happen, and the stigma that sometimes can be around it. Um, and in the book, we see that. We see how when she finds out, there are people who don't want to be around her. They, she's not invited to the, the party that, they ha that happens. People don't want her there. She's causing scenes by just being there. And that topic... I know some people aren't comfortable with it, but then again, not every person has to read every book. And for some people, that book could be a huge comfort in that situation. And I think that reading for teens to read this book, analyze this book and say, wow, not only is do I understand now that not all language I should repeat. Oh, I understand that there is other perspectives to different stories. And oh, wow, I know that this might be a big stigma, but this person has feelings. And all of the stuff that was talked about in the book it was framed in such a way that gave a good understanding to teens, and I think that that is where the book comes from, and it should stay for teens in the team room because of its significance in kind of that sense of what it can mean being a teen, seeing things, seeing your own self, and understanding how to move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, the floor is still open. If anybody else would like to speak on item, um, public hearing on an item agenda 12A. B. I'm sorry. A -B. A -B. I'd like to speak. Okay, thank you. Deborah Simon speaking for myself. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out is that this book is in the teen section. It is also in the children's section. Most of the words my children could read at three or four. This is a book that any child 
could pick up. Beyond that, most of what I've said is already in the packet. This is an overview. I have to be honest, wasn't a whole lot more I could come up with to say. I accept this. And this is an overview of the reconsideration process. I read it to a couple of people because I thought it was pretty raw, but I think it needs to be said. This is what I've learned in my use of the library's request for reconsideration process. From the public, I have learned that by requesting reconsideration of a book, I am trying to ban a book. Requesting reconsideration of a book is threatening and or circumventing parental rights. By requesting reconsideration of a book, I am being a fanatical Christian and pushing a dangerous agenda. A note on that, as far as I know, religion is still a protected class, except for me, apparently. Requesting reconsideration of a book wastes city employees' time and city resources. Other people's children's needs are more important than my children's needs. From librarians and the library advisory board members, I have learned that my assessment and interpretation of a given book are incorrect, but theirs is correct. I should not impose my values on others, but it's okay for others to impose their values on me. I am out of touch with modern day youth, despite being a credentialed and experienced high school teacher and a parent of two teens. I stifle free expression by requesting reconsideration of a book, so my free expression should be stifled. When I ask the library to provide details about a book's content to parents, I am expecting the library to take on a parental role. All children and teens should be able to read anything without their parents' knowledge or consent. I'm going to read that again, because I think a lot of people would be surprised at that. All children and teens should be able to read anything without their parents' knowledge or consent. I strongly disagree with that. If one person wants something, everyone else should have to deal with it. From city officials, I have learned that when I protest how I am treated, I am being overly dramatic. When I ask for reconsideration of a book, I am being narrow-minded. When I take responsibility as a library advisory board member seriously, I am being comical. When I protest inappropriate material in a book marketed to minors, I am oppressing certain protected classes. And I am left with two questions. If no one is allowed to move or remove a book, why is there a policy for it? And if I can disagree with the doctor, why can't I disagree with the librarian? Okay, thank you. And the floor is still open if anybody else would like to comment. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and move to item nine, which is a city manager memo on reconsideration policies. And did you? Do you have a summary or? Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this was actually in response to Ms. Simon's comment asking for me to clarify that what the purpose of the reconsideration policy is and how it is used. And really the bottom line is I want to emphasize that it is not, the, the bottom line is it's the reconsideration of policy exists for us to look at community standards. Is this something that should be in the library? Is it appropriate? Is it appropriate for the children's section, teen section, whatnot? And that's what this process is about. It is, if I don't agree that this complies with our community standard, I should be able to file a reconsideration to the librarian and to uh, through the entire process up to the library advisory board and even the city council. And so I just want to emphasize, we do not want to prohibit that process. We very much want to keep it open for members of our community to state, I don't think this agrees with what I believe is a community standard. And that's what this public process is for. So I very much encourage anybody to, to use the, the policy and to implement the policy. And I just wanted to clarify that in a memo. And I did let Ms. Simon know that I would do so, not only here, but with the city council, which it will appear in my report at the next city council meeting. Um, that's that's really the, the meat mm -hmm. and potatoes of, of the item. 
Okay, thank you. And um, is there any um, any discussion on item nine? I would like to um, just read the bullet points here in just a moment, but I wanted to open it up for discussion um, on the memo received from the city manager. Anybody have any items that they want to cover? You, Ms. Simon? We had a couple of board members last time commenting that their concern with following through on the process was a threat to parental rights. So what is your a take on that? Again, it is as far as a threat to parental rights, again, what you're trying to establish is, is this the proper reflection of our community standards? So I know our city attorney has prepared a memo that one thing to be concerned about is if there's something specifically written uh, that you believe is helpful or necessary and the access should be available to teens, you don't want to prohibit or restrict that access just because you don't like the book or because we don't, uh, I don't like the author or there's some really stinky books out there I don't like, but, <laughs> but um, if, if you really believe that this is not a good resource or it's been misplaced, then that's definitely an open use of the policy. So for example, um, the color purple is not necessarily written for a teen audience. However, it's standard reading, uh, at least when I was in high school. It was a, an assignment that we had, that the same with um, Animal Farm and uh, Lord of Flies, these were classic literature selections that may not be necessarily classified as young adult material, but were required reading in the high school. So what does that reflect in our community standard? Is it appropriate for it to be in the library? Um, that's a community decision. However, if I have a book like, um, I'm trying to think of, Nora Roberts' romance novel that was not written at all for young adults, and if we had something like that, place that's marketed for adults and our library placed it in the teen or children's section, we should absolutely use the policy to file for reconsideration. So I think it is a very fine line and there's no, there's no movie rating system that exists for books because literature is not only evolving, so is our community standard. And so it really is that discussion. Do we have an open process to hear all voices and do we agree whether or not a book should remain present? Um, when you're doing so just because I don't want kids to read the material, that's when you get into the legal gray area. So it's a very hard, I can't give you a checklist. Like these are the things that will get you sued and these are the things that won't. But we have to be really respectful that we are reflecting what the needs of our community. But you shouldn't be afraid of moving a book. I mean, once you listen to public hearing or once you you listen to what's impactful. Those are the decisions to be made and, and to discuss and deliberate. Okay, yeah, one more. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused. I'm trying to make sense of, of the ambiguity. Um, I understand, for example, color purple, it's, there aren't a whole lot of epistolary novels out there. And as an English teacher, that's, you're looking for form, obviously not trying to cross a line content wise if it's inappropriate, but you're looking for certain forms. But when you're, when you're looking at a public library, I guess my question is, are you saying there aren't any, when you say you can't move a book because you don't, because of what's in it, that's a, that's very general. And yet you shouldn't be afraid of moving a book. So where is that, if, if not the precision, where's the neighborhood, if you will? And again, it comes to that community standard. What, what do you think is a reasonable action on behalf of the community? Um, the rationale that our librarians use and then what, what I'll use in the review is how is this listed in um, the Library of Congress? How is this marketed by its publisher? What is the, the general genre 
that it's published for? Um, are the themes listed as such? Because we don't read every single book we order. Every, that would be impossible for our librarians to read every single book. So they really do base those decisions on what those tools are telling us. Now, if you as a board disagree with those tools and say in the Ketchikan community, these are the conflicts that we believe exist, that's the discussion you need to have. And, it, and so it, it is a tough decision. I can't give you a checkbox answer um, to say, if a book does A, B, and C, that needs to be in the adult section. Um, or if it meets these certain requirements, it should be in a teen section. It's, it really is difficult. I don't want to say impossible, it's, but it's incredibly difficult uh, when it comes to literature because it, it can be very subjective. There's, it's not, I can't give you an objective checklist or answer of what that is. You really have to do fill what you think is best for the community. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Stolle? Um, and um, just to clarify the uh, request for reconsideration process, the intention of that process is to have a conversation uh, with the person who has concerns about a particular book uh, or other item and to work through the reason that it was selected, the reason that it was placed where it was placed, and uh, the concerns that the person has in order to come to a better common understanding of why the book is where it is. And it is always possible that uh, librarians have made a mistake with a particular book. However, we do go to enormous lengths before we select the book to decide to acquire it, for one thing, and then to make sure that it is placed where it is most, we feel it is most appropriate. And uh, so I think the original intent and for me, still the intent is to have this conversation um, about how the library makes those decisions and what goes in. So it's not necessarily move it or don't move it. It is how did we come to this? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think it's important to have that conversation. And if I could add my own input on this topic, um, you know, from, from my from my perspective, I, I believe that there are. Um, a large variety of checks and balances in these types of things, including um, national resources, um, legal uh, precedent. We have um, a board. We have public comment. We have um, sometimes city councils involved, sometimes the, the school boards involved. We have a lot of different things that, that I believe give us a perspective on what our community standards are, but also how that aligns with a national conversation. And I think that, um, that especially those of us on the board, I think that we do a pretty good job of taking all that into consideration to make sure that we are uh, being as consistent as possible. Uh, but, I, but I do want to call out um, that uh, there's, um, we, there's a survey uh, that we'll talk about here in a, in a, in a moment. And and some of the items on that survey for young, are from young people, and um, and I do think that as a as a library advisory board, uh, that if there's one thing that I don't know if we've necessarily have done a fantastic job of, and I'm so happy, Sophia, that you're on at this table. So thank you very much for for volunteering for this. Is uh, getting that input from the young people. Uh, it is it, it it has been almost primarily uh, a very um, uh, more uh, adult driven conversation when when these things are directly impacting uh, these uh, these young people. So uh, that's that's my own personal perspective, but I did want to talk John the uh, the four specific bullet points just for anybody that has a chance to read read the memo. Uh, we have key points are the reconsideration policy offers a structured and transparent avenue for expressing concerns about library materials. Uh, bullet point two is it is not intended to stifle different opinions, but rather ensure a fair and balanced consideration of all viewpoints. Item three is these transparent re uh, review process. I'm sorry, this transparent review process reflects the diversity of our community while upholding established standards for library materials. And last, uh, the policy does not prevent anyone from expressing opinions or accessing information outside the library. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Um, and the, the bullet point. Um, I mean, Mr. Chair, 
Yes. When you're looking at these, I, I think that Mitch had sent the lab a memo yep. uh, last year, and it, it's those three standards, you know, um, where he said, let me get it out to you. Minors have a First Amendment right to receive information through the library. They can be protected from materials that are seen for minors, though they may not be considered obscene for adults. So under the Alaska state statute, the things to consider are, number one, the average individual applying community standards find the materials to be the purient interest in sex for persons under 16. A reasonable person would find the material taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, educational, political, or scientific value for persons under 16. And the material depicts actual or simulated conduct in a way that's patently offensive to the prevailing standards of the adult community as a whole with respect to what is suitable for persons under 16. So that, that's just based off of his memo. Sure. And that's really the good guideline, I think, for the board members to consider these three items. Great, thank you. Can I ask that I get emailed a copy of that? Because I don't know if I've had a thing I could reference with that. Yeah. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, well, would, you send, would you mind sending it out to everybody? Yeah. yeah I can send it right now. Thank you. And that's the November? Yes. Um, email. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and so moving on to item 10, we have public comment. This is for general comments. Um, and I do believe this, we did have a correspondence on this one for public comment, or was that for a future meeting? Sarah, um, is the, the, the or? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah. I just emailed it to you. I don't oh, everybody's that's address. Nice. That's, that's fine. I'll, I'll get it. Out. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let me go to that one. So to the library advisory board, good evening lab members. Some of you may have heard me speak to the recent city council meeting or are aware that I wrote a letter asking for the book, let's talk about it to be moved to the adult section of the library. I'm struggling with juggling my meetings so I've not been able to attend. Therefore I'm writing to you instead. I would like to see a book rating system take place at our public library that would benefit all persons and family units, Christians, LGBTQIA+, other abled minority persons with disabilities, and any other class of members of our community. Implementing a rating system for use in the communities of the public library would prioritize putting books in an age and developmentally appropriate section while meeting the needs of all community members. It would not put one set of beliefs over another in our community. It would give patrons the ability to make informed decisions like we can with comics, books, movies, and video games. As I said at the city council meeting, I am sad and disappointed that some people have decided to make this into an LGBT, LGBTQIA plus versus heterosexual or Christian issue. It is not about one group against another. It is an issue with the violence, child sexual assault material, pornography or cartoon pornography, illicit words, crime, and more being fed to children in our community without parental involvement or consent. Ms. Tully referenced the following from Ketchikan Public Library's 2023-27 strategic plan in her letter to the lab. Sustaining value number two, as an organization, we are committed to excellence and always strive to do better. The library serves the Ketchikan community. The library engages with the community. Where is the representation for all members of the community? Where is the support for the family unit, parents and guardians to have informed consent for books available to their children and families? Where is your concern for all groups and input from all, form and promotions of all groups? Would you rather community members and family come to the library and check out books or not come in at all? It appears you are only supporting a limited group in Ketchikan and that you are taking the route. It doesn't matter if others come in. You seem as if you're not interested in compromising in compromise or the engagement of all. You seem as if you are interested in serving the Ketchikan community in its entirety. I have been told by many of a fear in our community that if a person speaks up against any explicit book in the children's section, that their personal information will be published so others are able to ostracize them and bully them because they do, don't want a book in the children's section. It seems like this is counterproductive and not achieving anything. My idea of explicit and the library employee's idea of explicit are different. That is why a non-biased rating system is a beautiful thing. 
we can use it and not feel like it's up to one group or another. As I stated at the city council meeting, I have family members and friends that I love dearly that are part of the LGBTQIA community. If I have concerns about a book, regardless of it's heterosexual or LGBTQIA+, it is not because of the class or group, it is the content. The division and hostility being perpetuated in this community with misinformation is sad. No one, despite what group they are from, should feel less than loved and supported because someone wants to move a book to the adult section. With all of this said, it would benefit all members of our community to have a book rating system that everyone can use in order to select the desired reading material. Ms. Tully said in her response, the library's mission is to provide access to a wide range of books and other materials so that individuals and families may make their own decision about what is appropriate for themselves and their children. A rating system would give that flexibility and allow parents, families, and others to know what the content is. Let me ask you this question. Who orders the books for our library? Does that person or group know the content of the books? I believe that person or persons ordering the books do not know what they are ordering and many of them have read the books. Then it would not be much of a task to have a rating system and be able to rate the books in our library. This would give the community the confidence that you're serving all community members and that patrons could rely on those ratings to check books out. I also applaud anyone who has the courage to write a concern about any book in our public school or libraries they are the voice many people want to have but are afraid. What is your reason for not wanting to meet in the middle and compromise? I do believe the books in question and more that you are bringing into our library benefit some people. Let's find a way to work together and create trust by adopting a rating system. Respectfully, Cheryl Yisley. And I'll repeat, those are not my comments. Sure, thank you. All right, thank you. And so next we still have um, public comment open. Has anybody signed up? No one has signed up. Okay. And so the floor is open for general public comments. Uh, still uh, three minutes. I uh, ask that you keep it within three minutes per speaker. If anybody would like to add uh, general comments to, uh, for the Library Advisory Board. Okay. Seeing none. I'd like to speak. Oh, sure. Again, speaking on behalf of myself, eight years ago, I was having some mystery health issues. An astute osteopath did some testing and found out that I was allergic to soy, almonds, hazelnuts, walnuts, and peanuts, and sensitive to tomatoes, dairy, and seafood. When I told my husband, his response was, so what can you eat? Fair point. That was when my family started learning about label reading. Turns out I had to avoid all nuts, seeds, and their oils, making it even more complex. We'd scour store shelves for acceptable food choices, learning more than you'd ever want to know about facility warnings, equipment warnings, and multiple ways companies label allergens. It's definitely up to me to know what I'm eating. If you hand me a piece of candy and I eat it, it's not your fault if I go into anaphylactic shock because it contains peanuts. But if you hand me a piece of candy, I read the label to make sure it's safe, eat it, and then go into anaphylactic shock because it contains peanuts, it's not my fault so much as it's the food provider's fault for not correctly labeling the candy. In the U.S., food providers are required to post consumer warnings on any product containing one or more of nine major allergens. In Canada, the list includes 11 allergens. In the U.K., there are 14, and it goes up from there. If you think it's easy to label allergens or easy to get another allergen added to the list, just take a look back at the folderol surrounding the U.S.'s addition of sesame, in 2021. See, food allergies don't affect everyone, and change isn't always well accepted. But for those of us who are affected, it can mean a lot. We don't always get it right, though. For example, when it comes to allergens in the U.S., they classify coconut as a nut. Now, that may sound silly, but ingredient scouring is hard enough when things are properly classified. Throw in something obviously misclassified, and it becomes all that much more difficult. It's much the same with children's 
and youth literature. Violence, profanity, and sexual situations may not be allergens, but studies do show that all three can have a negative effect on a person's behavior, cognitive development, and social interaction. And in the US, we value an individual's right to choose, and at least for now, the parents and guardians' right to choose what is best for their minor. It's definitely up to the parents and guardians to know what their child is reading. And just like food, books need to be accurately labeled. We value our librarians for their industry knowledge, and this is part of that knowledge. It's not about judgment. It's about information. Just like you don't have to believe that soy oil will negatively influence my health to note that it's in food products, and you, you don't have to believe that sexual situations are an issue for minors to note that they're present in the book. Neither involve moral or ethical judgment, just information. And just like allergies, there are numerous criteria to note in books. This is an excellent situation for locally based libraries to be responsive to their patrons, survey parents, ask what their major allergens are when it comes to children's and youth literature. No, it won't be easy, but nothing ever good really is. Mr. Chair, can I ask her a question? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Ms. Simon, do you have a question? Uh, when you were just speaking, you mentioned that studies show. Is that showing that reading about sexual assault, violence, things like that, study, studies show that that neg neg negatively affects behavior or seeing and being involved in that? What Specifically, what is that? Reading them. And can you provide those studies? Yes, I can do that for you. I have them at home. I do not have them with me, but I'm happy to share them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and, and public comment is still open if anybody would like to add their own comments. Seeing none. Okay, thank you. We'll go and move on to reports. Uh, so our first report is Friends of the Library, Ms. Nina Hops. Ms. Hops. Hello. Hello. Um, so the report is we had a we have our big annual meeting. Let me get this correct. Um, Tuesday at six o'clock. Okay. Tuesday at six o'clock was our open to the public annual meeting um, next week, and we have a guest speaker, Sophia Pillen. And um, we have been having small meetings since our last report about um, the collection. We did our first book collection last month. Uh, we were open from two or noon, excuse me, noon to two. And we had, I would say, like 10 to 12 vehicles come by and bring us a bunch of books. So we're starting adding up our collections the first time we started since before COVID. So maybe start really sorting your books of high quality things that you'd like to donate. Our next donation is April 27th between noon to two at the U-Haul storage and check the Friends of the Library Facebook page for updates. Date again. Um, April 27th, Saturday, noon yes. to two, U-Haul over by the Trooper Station. There'll be signs out. No media, no encyclopedias or manuals, just good books, please. Just Nothing books. that's been chewed on by rats. <laughs> <laughs> or your 1995 textbook. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. That's about 1997. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good year. <laughs> Vintage. All right. Very cool. um, all right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next is uh, City Council. Anything for Mr. Finnegan? Yeah, the uh, City Council had an action item on the agenda at our previous meeting. Uh, it was, the question was split because there were really two items involved. And one was a reconsideration of the city manager's decision to keep the previously challenged title in place. And uh, that decision was upheld. So the book is going to stay where the Library Advisory Board had recommended that it would go or that it would remain. And then second to that was uh, removal of the fourth step of the reconsideration process, which had been enacted by the city council to make the city council the final line in that reconsideration process. Uh, the council decided to, uh, or voted in favor at least, of um, removing themselves from being that fourth step in the process because they can always, the council can always override a decision that's made by the manager. So if 
the council sees fit to do so in the future, then they can take that action of their own accord. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, may I ask a question, yeah. Your Honor? Um, I was just, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because um, I didn't get a chance to watch the meeting, so I'm curious to know, is that, so what way the policy is, once the city manager makes a determination on whether the decision will be upheld or not, there's no more reconsideration for the public. Is that correct? I'll defer to the manager. Would you, would you call that an accurate? I, I would say that's accurate. However, if you have a city council member who would like to bring it forth, then that would be the process. So rather than making it an automatic from the lab, from the librarian to the lab, to the manager, to the council, you would have to have that extra step. So if it's something uh, that the count, a counselor wants to bring forth, they would do that under their capacity as a city council. And, uh, but it would be automatic, you know, citizen placing something on the agenda. Uh, as a clarifying uh, follow-up then, um, is, that go is that process gonna be in writing? Is that gonna be public? Like if I just move here from somewhere, right. how am I gonna know that I have that opportunity to go to the council if I still have concern? It wouldn't be necessarily in writing, but that's a good point. I have to think about how that language could be clear. So people understand that even if it's a statement, the city manager reports to city council, you know, and and any decisions could be could be addressed through the city council. That might be good clarifying language. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Finnegan. And uh, then now for the borough assembly, Ms. Arnson. Thank you, Your Honor. I would be happy to take back any information to the assembly that the board wants, but I don't have any report specifically for, that's relevant to the library at this time. Perfect, all right, thank you. Uh, and our team representative survey, Ms. Sophia Pilgrim. Yes, yeah. so about two weeks ago, I sent out a survey to it was only to KI students, which I regret that I did not find a way to send it out to Novella students as well. But in my capacity, I was only able to go to my principal and say, will you please send this out? Um, going forward, if I do another survey, I'll find a way to include Novella students in that. I'd just like to apologize that I didn't find a way to do that. Um, but yes, so I sent out a survey. I got 61 responses in total. Uh, that one of the last ones was as of this morning. So information here is as of last night at about five o'clock when I printed this all out. Um, so at the time I printed this out, there were 57 responses. So 16 of those were freshmen, 19 were sophomores, 14 were juniors, eight were seniors. Um, and so mainly a sophomore response, but you know, I can understand some people are busy. Some people just don't want to fill out a survey. Um, going on to the second question, how often do you go to the public library? I got a resounding 36 people that said, I don't go at all. And while it's a little disappointing to hear it, that just leaves a lot of room for improvement. And it helps me know, okay, how can I advertise this? Okay, how can I help people understand reasons to go to the library? Might help clear up some clarification of why people can't go to the library, things like that. Um, we got 18 people that said they went one to three times, eight people that went four to seven, five that said they went seven to more. Um, and then for people that chose the answer that said they went zero times, they were asked the question, why do you not go to the library? Um, and I have some responses listed and I would just like to clarify that because there were 57 people responding and I, some of them were just meh, I don't like book. There, there were some as simple and plain as that. I did not include all of them in this report because they were not productive, I should say, but if anyone wanted the full access to the form, I would be willing, happy to supply it. So we have some of the responses here of why they choose not to go to the library. Um, May I ask a mm -hmm. question? On some? So for of the list, and I'm, I'm assuming, I, I think you probably would have added it, but I, I think it'd still be good to ask, were any of the responses that said that they um, had any kind of negative connotation to the library at all, any negative experience or anything like that? Um, there were two, I would say, that were like that, and I did not include them for the reasons that there was some, there was some derogatory language in them. Okay. Um, okay. There was, I got a few comments that were specifically targeted at me as a person. Um, again, we're not productive, but I would be more than happy to supply them 
to the council or to the board if they wanted them. But again, it was not like, oh, I don't go to the library because I don't feel under or I feel underrepresented. It was things like, I don't go to the library because I think it's disgusting. Like there were things like that. They weren't productive. That didn't give us any feedback. Um, but again, I would be happy to supply the full form if okay. anyone I, wanted it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, but yes. And then any more questions about this? How was the survey su um, submitted to the students? Was it emailed? Was it a paper thing? It was email. It was, it was email. sent to all of the students who were not opted out of surveys. Um, and it was an optional survey and it was a completely anonymous survey as well. Were there um, other options, paper options for students that don't have access to email, or um, computers, or e internet at home? Well, at K High, every student has a supplied computer and they have Wi Fi at school hours to complete it. Um, so that's where I was kind of like, I think everyone would, every K High student that was sent to would have the opportunity to fill it out. Um, Just the reason I ask is because yeah. I read a comment in here about um, saying if the, if, the library advertised there was Wi-Fi and study spaces that more yeah. kids would go there. So I was wondering if maybe there were students that didn't have access to that that would um, would have yeah. benefited more um, from library. I definitely think that I, I have a plan to put a poster kind of like basing off of the responses I got being like, this is what's advertised, here's what, what's offered at the library to kind of clarify. because starting conversations some people didn't know that there was free wi-fi some people didn't know that they could use the study rooms things like that that i want to be openly advertised um awesome. and then the next question was why why do you go to the library things like that um i think i only had about one page of responses from that because again some of them weren't super productive good feedback um they were just like because it's fun because i like like the things like that so again willing to supply the full form, but this is just what was most productive, I suppose. Um, and then I asked, what specific genres do you want to see, or do you like and want to see more representation of? Um, fantasy came in first with 28 votes. Action and, and adventure fiction came in with 27. Young adult romance came in with 24. And mystery and LGBTQ plus followed with 18 votes. Um, then I asked below that, why do you like slash want to see more of this genre? Um, and I uh, supplied a few of them because most, again, all of the questions on here were optional. I should say that to complete the form, you did not have to fill out every question. Um, all of them were optional. So some people could have said, I like this genre, but then not answered why they like it. So there were varying responses from that. And some that just said, I don't know, things like that. So this is just like a handful of the ones I got that I felt were productive. Um, and then I left a question at the bottom that was, do you have anything else you want to let the library advisory board know? And I got a lot of comment on that. Um, I think there's two whole pages of comment and I wanted to include even the ones that I think were a little bit harsh choice words per se, but I think I, I, I felt like it was good to include all the ones that were productive. Um, there, it's a lot of good information on here and it definitely speaks to what teens are saying and kind of what they believe or at least the people who cared enough to open a survey about the library the people who go to the library things like that what they were willing to say um so i included about two pages of those um i definitely got a few that i was like wow this person definitely goes to the library like on the back there's one that was about a whole paragraph long being like i think that the water bottle filler can only fill up a fourth of my water bottle a fourth and they they were very very they felt strongly about that. And so I was like, wow, this person definitely feels strongly about this. Um, there was a, there was a couple that mentioned specific authors and there was one response that said, I only read William Sleater books. I hope you have one I haven't read yet. And I was like, okay, this is, this is something I can do. This is specific. I bet I could tackle this one. William Sleater is dead. He has no new books coming out. So at some point we, we it's all, it's all, He's put out the books he will, and if he, if he's read all of them, I am not sure how I can help. But, you know, I, I'm glad I got some comment back. And next year, when I'm still hopefully at the beginning of the school year, I'll hope to put out another improved survey to both K-High and Revilla students um, asking similar questions. Uh, and if you think that there should be different questions asked, feel free to let me know, and I'll include that in the next one.
Okay. Can you reach out to Zachary Trudeau with Fast Track too, with all of them? Yes, I'll write that down. And any questions, Mr. Spogum? I do have a comment. Oh, yes, Ms. The water bottle situation is currently in the works, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's it's a it's coming through friends of the library. It's just slow. <laughs> and again, this was an anonymous survey, so even if I wanted to tell them, I can't. But I might add a little note that says "water bottle filler" in coming the process, soon. <laughs> just just for that. You mean the high school doesn't know that Nina's been trying to <laughs> a water bottle filler since I joined the board? <laughs> the board. <laughs> And being bank shares. Traffic question. And I do have a comment for you, but Ms. Ms. Hops, um, one of the one of the items in here was new um, chess pieces. Is that something that the friends of the library? Is that like a, um, somebody wanted? I think yeah. if the librarians make a request, then we can. I think I can speak to this. Um, we actually uh, have quite a number of uh, chess sets of okay. uh, various kinds. A lot of them, uh, Umi Bartos yeah. uh, donated. Yeah. Um, and uh, so um, we can definitely consider uh, maybe using uh, one of those sets and making it available. Oh, great. Okay. Great. That's fantastic. Okay. And I think, yeah. isn't it moving around? The chessboard is moving. So yeah. changes are coming. Okay, great. That's, That's a good question. James. Yeah, absolutely. So to get chess, just to clarify for me, if someone wanted to have a chess set brought out, do they have to go and ask the desk for that? Okay. Yes, currently they, they ask at the desk, we give them the chess set, and then they sit down at the table, uh, at the chess table. Yeah. And... I, speaking from personal experience, I would probably be a little scared to ask for that. Not now, but like if I was just beginning to go to the library, I might be like, oh, do I, do I go and ask? So it might be nice to include like, and for like chess pieces, things like that, go up to the front desk and feel free to ask. Just so on the poster, they're like, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. I can, I can do that. That's a good Great, thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Had a couple, couple things. Okay, so first, uh, this is fantastic. I really appreciate you doing this. This is really great. Um, first, before I, I go over any, any of my comments, if you could see if you would be um, able to, I don't know, is this a, I don't know if this is something that the board would have to approve, but um, it would be great to reach back out and just let everybody know that we got the feedback, we heard it, that their, their voice was heard. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate, uh, at least I do, really appreciate uh, their responses and particularly anything else that they want to let us know. So we pass on that, that we got it, we heard it. We yeah. Appreciate it. I, because it was all anonymous, it's really, it's right. almost impossible. I, I'm sure there's a way that they could find people who did this, but like that would be a whole thing. I think what I could do is it on the poster, I could say based off of your feedback, like thank you and based, based yeah, off your feedback, yeah. this is what we want to say, yeah, things like great. that. Yeah, that'd be perfect, okay. yeah, that'd be perfect. Um, and then for my own personal thoughts on on the feedback is, is um, I within the, um, the two, the first thing is the um, the seven plus or the, the five par participants in the survey that come, um, seven plus times a month, that's still almost 10% of those who filled out the survey. That's still a large section of, of, our, of our young people that are utilizing this library, which is fantastic. Uh, and then even the other eight folks that say four to seven times a month, um, I feel like I pop in the library fairly regularly and I'm not here four to seven times a month. So that's, I, I think that's great that um, there's a lot of young folks that, that say that they're, they're not using it and you know, they also, but they also point out that they do use the K High Library and they have other sources to get materials that they're looking for. But I would say, of the folks that are using it, they're they're using it quite a bit, and I think that's that's really important to point out. That's fantastic. And then uh, the other pieces I wanted to highlight the fact that the um, when they uh, do talk about what they'd like to let us know is um, that they're very uh, they're very vocal in that. They want to make sure that their voice is represented, that we're considering their perspective. Um, and I think that that's really important that we lift that up and we say, okay, our young people are asking that all of us as adults pay attention to what they're saying. And so that's another reason I wanted to see if we could just some kind of message. But I think that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, there was, there was definitely reading through these comments. A lot of them were like, 
they were asking to be listened to. Um, and I've, I wish that going forward, I can do like a very good job of letting them know that they do have a voice on the board, that it's not like, I know that there can be a lot of resentment that can come up when they don't feel represent, like when we don't feel represented, represented. Um, and I, I wanted to like, I was also going to include on the poster, like you do have a voice. And if you, if anyone wanted to ask me anything or have me say something for them, I've had a couple of people say, you know, I don't want my name attached, but can I, can you read this for me? And following the legality of that, um, it's just, I want their, that I want them to know that they do have a voice and that they do have someone who will say what teens are wanting them to say. And I'm glad that the survey kind of showed that right. and also showed that like, that a lot of teens would come to these meetings. I think they just don't know that they happen. So I will also want them, the poster would say, you know, when we have these meetings, if you wanted to, but also they have the tag group that you can go to these librarians if you have specific questions. It's not like this one big step. It's just like you have resources and if you wanted to, feel free to use them. Great. Excellent. Any other comments, questions? All right. Thank you again. Um, so next we have uh, the librarian uh, report, Ms. Tilden. So um, uh, you've got my, my usual uh, big list of things that have happened again at the moment. And um, so lots and lots of programming. Uh, um, also, and I think we touched on this a little bit, um, there are big changes that are happening and kind of being uh, rearranged. Uh, more study spaces, uh, and um, so that is really exciting to see. Uh, and some of that was in response to uh, Sophia's uh, survey results, uh, which um, she shared with uh, uh, Amy Tupper. And so um, that we're in the middle of making those changes. And uh, yeah, it's very exciting to see. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple of milestones that people have hit over the past couple months. Um, head of Adult and Technical Services, Lisa Pearson, she celebrated her 25th anniversary at the library in February. Um, we also, uh, just this morning, uh, we had a five-year milestone. Rebecca Brown has been our outreach librarian for um, five years and um, doing an incredible job. Uh, you would never know that she uh, works 24 hours a week because she does enough um, to be full-time and more. And also, sadly, our office manager, Kelly Johnson, uh, retired after 31 and a half years. Uh, and um, her last day was on March 15th. Uh, we very much miss her. Uh, we're in the middle of a search for um, someone to do office manager and um, also some cataloging and some desk work. Uh, and in the meantime, Robert Rice, who is a, a library assistant too, uh, he is kind of uh, filling in and doing uh, the financial um, and payroll stuff. So, um, and then finally, uh, the library closed February 20th to the 23rd to conduct our annual inventory of collections. Um, of, of the 65,000 physical items uh, inventory, uh, there were just 146 that were unaccounted for, or 0.22%. Great. Any questions? Yes, when they're missing, what is the process that you do? You replace them, or just wondering? It depends. Yeah, it depends on the on the item. Um, sometimes uh, they're replaced if they if we feel that they're still valuable, and sometimes we need to decide to replace them. Any other questions? Um, if I could just real quick, at um, one. Um, 31 years, that, that is a tremendous amount of experience. Oh, yeah, yeah. just really, really appreciate the service. That is fantastic. Absolutely. And Absolutely. then also um, for 25 years, Ms. Pearson, um, also a tremendous amount of experience and value to the community, so. Very fortunate, we've been very, very fortunate. Yeah, so if, uh, next time we see her, thank you for her service. I fantastic. absolutely will. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll go move on to the library use report. I know it's your turn. Yes, here we go. Um, so this is based on our based on a request um, about uh, the use of the library 
And um, this is a, there was a similar request made in January um, about the use of the library for the fourth quarter of 2023, so I included that information. And uh, one thing that was asked for were the um, number of specific unique individuals who use library services. And although for a large number of library services like programs, we're not able to provide that kind of information, so we just don't track specifically who goes to programs. Uh, for a few uh, um, services, we were able to provide um, that information. Um, we have a number of individuals who have checked out or reviewed physical material from slavery. This is for the last quarter of 2023. And that turns out to be almost 3,000 individuals. I was I was a little surprised. That, that seems a little high, but um, uh, the system hopefully does not lie. Uh, we also use uh, vendor information to count the number of unique individuals who have checked out electronic books and audiobooks from the uh, Alaska Digital Library. Um, for that same quarter, 530 individuals, and uh, the number of unique individuals who have logged into the library's public Wi Fi. Um, which is 634. And um, uh, our Wi Fi gets a ton of use, so I'm not surprised. Um, but we also do a ton of things where we do not track individuals um, public computer use, program attendance, um, online program viewers, and we do have um, many of those, uh, in house use of material. When somebody like takes a book off a shelf, they read it for a couple hours, and then they, then they hopefully put it on a shelf um, so we can count it as in-house. Uh, we do not track who has done that. Uh, the use of the study or meeting room. Um, families who visit the play area, we don't track that. Um, visits to school classrooms, uh, don't track like the children or even the classes. Um, library participation and other organization events, which we do several times a year and outreach visits to facilities. Um, we track the number of those visits, but we do not track um, the specific, specific individuals who are present in those facilities and who attend the program. Um, so, uh, so that's, those are all the limitations on um, uh, library use. Uh, I also included um, visitors to the library, which is like a gate count. So basically we have a little counter um, on the gate, every time somebody goes past it, it just ticks up one. Um, now, what we do is we take a count at the beginning of the day, we take it at the end of the day, and then we cut it in half because all the people who come in then also go out. Uh, so, um, so it is not like completely um, uh, accurate, but it's probably the best we can consider. So. Uh, comparing 2023 to 2022, um, we are have about oh, this is, what did I say, 10 percent something like that um, uh, increase in our use. We're still pretty far below our 2019 use. That was the last full year before the pandemic started. Um, so we're still about a third down, pretty consistently on checkouts and also on study room and meeting room. Use. Uh, however, 2023, we were we had our full 58 hour open times uh, only about half of the year. Um, so we're it'll be interesting to see how 2024 shakes out. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's kind of my summary of all this. And uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thanks, when you compare 22 and 23, mm -hmm. how much of that? I'm just just eyeballing it, how much of that can you attribute possibly to the increase in summer uh, tourists? Not all that much. We generally have um, about one or two tours that come in a day um, during tourist season. So that can be six to 12 people who come around. And so it's there's, there, you know, some people there, but it's not as though we have people all day coming through. Um, we also have the occasional person that actually walks up the hill. Um, they are always amazingly surprised. <laughs> They're usually out of breath. <laughs> okay, I made it up the hill. Um, now, what about that free Wi-Fi? 
but there are very few um, uh, of our visitors who kind of bring uh, the hill um, to get up the top. It's mostly those couple of tours a day. So, um, so to a certain extent, yes, but um, I think not to a significant I think so. Just to clarify the information, mm -hmm. when it says the Ketchikan Public Library visitors, the library visitors, those are visits, right? These are the ones that you that are cut in half, mm -hmm. um, and so they're not necessarily that five thousand eight hundred ninety nine visitors came through, but that it was visited at least that yes. many yes. times. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then I'm also just to speak to the last question too. Mm -hmm. I'd be. I'd be willing to guess that because school's out is another reason why we see those summertime days go up. And that could be very well because we have our um, uh, kids and teen summer reading programs. And so um, there are families that come in uh, much more frequently um, because their kids are involved in the reading program and uh, you know they're, they're coming in and getting books and getting prizes and that kind of thing. So yeah, absolutely. One more clarification. Yes. Um, so, and just to uh, th this might not be the place to get this answered, um, but I'm just curious to know with the some of this information that isn't tracked because it's near not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, how is it that the library measures how well they're achieving the four goals? Let's see, I think that's a good um, a lot of it is sort of, as far as uh, programs, a lot of it is, is attendance-based. Uh, so um, uh, what's the attendance, we can track that by, um, uh, by program. Uh, so we can look and say, oh, you know, we really thought this, you know, adult art program was going to go, you know, great guns, and yet it didn't end up, uh, you know, happening. And, you know, should we do that again, or is it really not worth the time the, the space that we need to, um, to do it. Uh, so, um, and we pretty much do that throughout the year. It's not something we kind of like all sit down and do once a year. It's kind of program by program uh, where we kind of look at it and say, is it worth trying again, maybe? And maybe we'll try it again. we get the same result. And we might decide to put it on a hiatus for a while. Uh, just to clarify then one last one. Um, so the goal, like, the goal for the library is a growing, vibrant organization. There's no, this is how we know that we're a growing, vibrant organization. Is that correct? See, I think we measure it kind of by all of this. You know? but, um, sure. Okay. But yeah, Thank you. So there's okay. not kind of concrete, okay, if these things go up, um, uh, then, you know, we're a growing, vibrant organization. Uh, like I said, I we pay a lot of attention to this just because during the pandemic it it, it tanked um, uh, for understandable reasons, um, and we're still recovering from that. So we're we are not back where we were in 2019. So I think we're just kind of working on slowly getting people back. Thank you. Thank you. I have a Quick question, um, just out of curiosity, when you say you have a gate counter, yes. um, where is that located? Ah, it's located on our gate, which is right it's before you get to the circulation desk. Okay, so, so every time center. somebody leaves the library to go to the bathroom and yep. come back in, it counts them as a new visit. Yes. Okay. So that's why it's not tremendously accurate. Okay. So is, it's just kind of the best we can do. And is there any way to move that to the front door? Since there isn't a way that really works with the front door being able to lock the front door. The great thing about the gate is that there's no kind yeah, of like you locking pass through, yeah. Of, yeah. So um, I was just curious yeah. of where it was if we're counting bathroom trips or my right. children going back and forth 40 times when I'm trying to find my library card and my <laughs> wallet. <you know? laughs> it's happened. Yeah, it's it's an approximation. Gotcha. Absolutely. Looks like Ms. Topher. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. So, okay. <laughs> I'm only 5'2". It doesn't count me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting that the, the gate doesn't, if you're under a certain height, the gate doesn't count you. Gotcha. Sure. 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 Sure.
perfect. Any other questions? Sure. Um, perfect. We'll go ahead and close uh, on item 11. We'll take a uh, 10 minutes recess. How's that sound? Good. Good. Back to order. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, so we just finished off reports. We're going to move on to item number 12, unfinished business. Uh, this is kind of the, the meat of the agenda. So there's a couple of quick items or a couple of uh, quick things before we go into it. First, I wanted to thank everybody who uh, uh, came up and spoke regarding uh, any of the agenda items that we're discussing here tonight. And two, um, is since we do have many items in our agenda that we do need to cover, and let's make try to be um, as concise as we can. Make you know, um, we keep the keep the conversation moving along so we can make sure we can uh, uh, tackle all of these and get through them tonight because uh, they're all very important. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, item 12A, which is uh, there's a um, the report for legal opinion uh, the, for the last paragraph of the proposed resource placement section of the collection development policy. Uh, we did receive a, um, a an opinion from Mr. Mitch Siever, who is the city attorney, uh, and um, and just just to. Just to get the conversation started, I did, would like to read just for uh, public. Uh, so anybody that's tuning in that the um, kind of I'll go to the end uh, of Mr. Seaver's comments. Uh, uh, regarding the statute in place is the statute makes clear makes a clear distinction between public libraries and school libraries. Because the Ketchikan public library is operated by a municipality, it falls under section a. Since it is not a school uh, library under subsection B, so is saying that it falls under subsection A. Uh, personal identification, which um, which then if we go to subsection A, subsection A means that personal identifying information of people who have used materials <clears throat> made available by the city's library must be kept confidential, absent a court order that the confidential information is released. Um, so it seems a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, response from the city attorney, uh, but I wanted to see if there's any, um, any input from the city manager, then we'll go to uh, any board comments. Anything else you'd like to add? I, I don't have anything to add at this yeah. time. Okay. I can offer anything during the discussion. Great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, any, any discussion on this topic? Yes, Ms. Simon. I think this is probably something that most parents don't know, community members don't know. Um, I think it's a, I have a huge problem with that. And I've been told by an assistant attorney general that Parents can still challenge the constitutionality of that. And I think we all know that well, I'll just say that I I think we need to make sure people know that. And if we're going to, if the library is going to stand on the fact as the attorney says, that it's required constitutionally, then you, we, the library needs to make sure the parents know that. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I uh, support what Ms. Deborah's, uh, Ms. Simon's position is on this. And I'm curious to know, how do minors get library cards? Let's see, um, here in Ketchikan, minors get library cards uh, from, usually, if they're part of the school system, they get uh, library accounts from their school. Well, um, if, if they're not in the public school system, how does a minor acquire a library card? So they come in with a parent or guardian, and uh, the parent or guardian provides the kind of information we would uh, require of a, an adult. So a valid Alaska picture ID and something with their current catch can address on it, like a, a 
utility bill. And once they provide those, there is a form that uh, the child or the parent can fill out. All the, all the child has to do is he has to be able to write their uh, name or print their name. Um, and then the parent signs off on it, and then they get a card. To clarify then, so the parent has to give their ID, mm -hmm. right, their identification, and they fill out the information. Mm -hmm. So that's basically when the parent is granting permission for the child to have access. Right, and that, that is indicated in the form. And then there, I know that in the school district, they have a process mm -hmm. for the parents to give permission for the, for the library, right? Um, and then, then the child must have the ability to print their name in order to get a library card. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Um, I appreciate they have to be five and to be at least five. I will maybe sometime share with you my experience and my child of trying to attain a library card, okay. uh, but I don't want to get into it too much uh, at this meeting. Um, so it would be interesting if there was like just even a notice when they sign that piece of paper mm -hmm. that that is just publicly reminded that we are going to follow the law. I'll check and see if it's already on there. If it's not, we can add it. It'd be great if we could see that. Yes, Ms. Uh, to the librarian, I have been told by a member of the public that her granddaughter was able to obtain a, or our grandson was able to obtain a library card through the school without the parents' knowledge. What is the process? I don't know what the school's process is. If, if the child has a card through the school mm -hmm. and they check books out mm -hmm. that have to be retrieved from the public library, mm -hmm. how is that handled? Oh, uh, they can put a hold on um, the book that's at the public library. And uh, then um, we uh, pack up those books that have been requested uh, by a student or staff or faculty member at the school. And uh, then a courier um, comes and uh, takes those to the various libraries, uh, the home library of the student. And uh, then the library staff at that school um, then notifies the student and it's checked out there. Then in light of this, is that under the school's auspices or is that under the public library's auspices specifically? Is that information hidden from the parent? Ah, uh, that could, uh, because the rules for school libraries are different under the law, uh, my understanding is that um, uh, for materials checked out at the school library, it is possible um, for a parent to ask about a child's account at the school library. Even when the book is retrieved from the public library? And if I may clarify, because mm -hmm. it's different than any other source that gets a piece of media to the, the school library, mm -hmm. wherever it comes from, once it's, once it's in the school library, it's checked out through the school library system. Yes. And then it becomes essentially, lack of a better term, their ownership of mm -hmm. that media during that process. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, uh, I think, uh, like I said, I, I believe that the, um, the city attorney's um, opinion is pretty straightforward, but I would invite any parents out there that, um, that have, you know, that wanna be engaged in the type of materials and media that their children may have access to in any public library or any school library, to have those conversations with your children, uh, make you know, uh, you know, essentially that is uh, really a great opportunity to get those 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 sometimes difficult conversations started. Uh, but here at the public library, um, like I said, it is pretty straightforward um, as as far as what the feedback or what the opinion is from the attorney. Uh, any other comments? Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to item 12B, which is a uh, proportion of teen fiction, uh, I'm sorry, proportion, proportion of teen fiction to nonfiction uh, report from the library director uh, from the January 10th meeting. 
Um, yes, so I have a little memo here, a little one-page memo. Um, uh, what I did was uh, I um, uh, discussed uh, this with the head of youth services, uh, uh, Amy Kupfer, and uh, she indicated in Lisa Pearson, who is the head of adult services, there's a similar uh, portion in the collection development policy for adult uh, materials. They both indicated that that was not useful. Um, uh, and then I uh, did a poll of uh, library directors who have access. Um, the top 20 uh, municipalities in the largest municipalities in Alaska, and asking them whether they had proportions of materials, fiction versus nonfiction, in their libraries, and uh, of the 10 uh, library directors who responded, none of them uh, had uh, collection development policy with those kind of you know, half fiction, half nonfiction. It was always, um, that was always a myth. Uh, so uh, what we concluded uh, was that these did no longer serve a purpose in our collection development policy, and um, that we will um, uh, delete these in the next proposed revision um, of the collection development. Do you have um, I, numbers? Um, I know in, in you, sorry, I, I don't need them now, but just in, in general before this comes up at our next collection development policy overall, um, you said in here um, that these proportions are no longer useful. Mm -hmm. And then halfway through that paragraph, um, the fiction is far more popular than nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be, uh, I, I'd really like to see the numbers. I mean, if you have a thousand books checked out and 990 of them are fiction and only mm -hmm. 10 of them are nonfiction, um, you know, whatever, you know, kind of statistics that mm -hmm. you could provide on that, if, right. if that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, just so when we do take another look at the collection development policy, you know, mm -hmm. we, if we're going to be changing those proportions, you know, to just have an accurate depiction of what um, is actually being checked out mm -hmm. and um, it would be nice to see those numbers. Okay. Yes, um, referencing Sophia's diagram, um, when the the teens were talking about what books they checked out, there was the history was like one percent, one book, so there wasn't really a nonfiction thing. But in the comments, a lot of the teens are saying that they they're doing schoolwork, they're doing it at their high school, mm -hmm. and since the, the library doesn't provide necessarily curriculum based, the nonfiction books that the teens would need access to to do their work would necessarily be at the high school, not they're not using the library for that yeah. nonfiction reference purpose necessarily. Yeah, and well, when I had originally brought this up, it wasn't so much. Um, uh, towards you know getting reference books in there and i know what the you know the schools have far more things and we don't provide curriculum support that is in the collection development policy policy my issue with it was because it clearly states in the in the policy that it it should be approximately half and half and when i went through um the the catalog uh by hand looking at the the numbers because of my concerns about these books that were up for reconsideration and the reasons why those books are, you know, we want to keep them in, you know, because of suicide issues and, and LGBTQ, you know, making kids feel more comfortable and stuff. And then looking at the lack of, of mental health and suicide prevention and all of these things that, that it are not existed in the nonfiction section um, that could also help children in addition to these books that were up for re reconsideration. Um, not having those resources, and I don't. To me, those that is not curriculum support. That is mental health support, mm -hmm. and that should be available in every library for every kid, every age group. You know, because those are real issues that our children are facing, and so that's where this kind of came from. Was you know, I discovered the lack of nonfiction books available to children and teens when our policy clearly says it's supposed to be there and it wasn't. So that's, that was my concern with this. And so I understand that kids aren't, you know, going to the public library to write a book report on Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. you know, but, 
you know, if they have nowhere to go after school and they feel sad and depressed and they want to know why their brain is misfiring, you know, that's a different book that they might be looking up that they're not going to find there. So that was my concern. I think we mean more of those materials, period. Yes. I think there's, there's just not in existence yeah. as part of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, just um, to your point that the um, those resources don't exist, I'm not quite sure they don't. Um, uh, I think um, that um, books that are written for teens um, on these issues um, uh, are in our collection. Um, and books written for parents about teens who may be suffering from those issues are in the adult section. Yeah. And uh, so... Um, I was just hoping there would be more, I guess, is what... when. When I actually looked at, at the at the numbers and saw what was on the shelves, it was just it was depressing. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and move on to item twelve C. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Sure. Um, uh, I was wondering if we could um, circle back to twelve A. Sure. Because I don't. I think. In January, when we were voting on the resource placement section, mm -hmm. uh, I think we, uh, I think it was voted uh, to um, recommend all but the last paragraph, mm -hmm. and that last paragraph was the paragraph about privacy laws. And so I don't know whether that last paragraph has to be um, voted on by the board. No. To recommend so um, keeping that or not keeping that. Um. So. So just so, so it was voted on with the exclusion of the last paragraph, and so that last paragraph was excluded, mm -hmm. and so now we have the opinion. So we have, we probably need to vote to have it re-added. Is that my understanding? Where right, we're exactly. That would be that red, just a little red section. Okay. That um, then. Um, in the collection, page three in the collection development policy. But while I'm looking at my page three, then um, I will entertain a motion. This one. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your Honor, I move that we append the statement regarding privacy laws of the state of Alaska to the collection development policy. Second. Okay, moved by Mr. Finnegan, second by Ms. Govars. Um, any discussion? All right, so we'll go ahead and Ms. Pollock and get the roll. Uh, Montgomery. Yes. Pilgrim. Yes. Simon. No. Dahl. Yes. Arnstein. No. Finnegan. Yes. Bill Yes. Ops. Yes. See, so that is one, two, three, four, six. Six to two, um, the motion passed. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing us back. All right. Can I ask for one thing, Zero? Yeah. Um, just since we got back onto that, I didn't want to mention this or make a motion to amend or anything, um, but just to go back uh, to what we talked about earlier about making sure that that statement is added on the on the registration form? Yes, the yeah. registration form, thank okay. you. Um, I, I would also like to see that uh, there's a note that the child can request, like a, a spot where they can check, does their parent have permission to access their, if that's what you decide is a good place to do that. That's okay, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to go and move on to item 12C. Under what circumstances may the board chair vote? Um, so any, I believe we've kind of rolled into that already, but uh, any discussion on this? Um, floor is open. Yes, ma'am. I'll just make a comment because I have an opinion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, I am of the opinion that we've all been put on this board uh, to give our opinion and our perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, because if the chair is not voting, it's a not, it's a, it's an even vote. Mm -hmm. I would be of the opinion that as a general policy, the chair should vote. Mm -hmm. I don't see a reason why the chair wouldn't vote. Mm -hmm. um, but if there was a good reason, then I would, 
entertain that, um, but that's just seems to me like it would be the right thing for the chair to vote. Sure. But I don't know. Yes, Sure. Um, Reed, and I just want to pull on that thread a little bit more. Each of you were appointed to represent a particular portion of a community or an agency or an organization. I'm, by disallowing your chair to vote, you're disallowing the, the organization that they represent. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. Or the body they represent. Any other comments? Um, I would just say that the city code does state that the nine members of the library advisory board are voting members. Mm -hmm. So it seems to dovetail with what Board Member Arnson is suggesting. Any other comments? I'll add mine. Um, I, I I agree with the um, city manager. I this is a I regardless as a maybe a less formal than we have. Let's say at a um, um, city council or an assembly meeting, uh, and I think having all of us in these seats, um, either appointed by by someone in your organization or having um, uh, just having the passion for this, I think it really. Um, I think every vote counts and every vote matters. Huge fan of democracy, so um, yeah, I, I fully support uh, chair voting. Can I ask a question? Yeah. There's no. Is there a policy on this? Let's see. Information. I mean, like, does the library, Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, board members, there is no board policy. What would happen is you, as a board, would make a motion that this is going to be our adopted process, and so, so we don't have a formal board policy. I am rewriting the entire Keshkin Municipal Code regarding our advisory boards, but it won't be done until next year. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. I move that the uh, Chair be a voting member of this board at all times. Second. Okay. Um, uh, motion by Ms. Dahl, second by Mr. Finnegan. Any other discussion on the topic? I just have to play a little bit of devil's advocate because sure. uh, there may be some situations. I don't know what they would be, but there could potentially be a conflict of interest. So I'm just a little concerned that that phrase eliminate somebody's ability to recuse themselves or to address a potential conflict of interest. I, I don't, we don't deal with money, so I'm not thinking, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, so I would move to amend the motion to say that all members present at the meeting are to vote on issues. Would you like a friendly amendment? In front of them. I don't like friendly amendments. <laughs> I would, I would be in agreement with that. Thank you. All right, so we have a agreement. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. Um, so if, if I could just clarify, the motion is uh, the chair votes, or I'm sorry, say that again, one more time. All members of the board are to vote on issues and matters of the, of the board. All members on issues and matters of the board. Okay, sure, sounds good. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, then we'll go call vote. Let's see. What, uh, oh, I am, uh, to clarify, I am confused if I can vote on this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I am to vote on this. It, but I'll call your name. Yeah. yeah I, I wouldn't because oh. you're, you adopted a process at the beginning of the right. meeting. Okay. So I would stick with that until the vote. Obviously. Sounds good. Okay. Yep. Just, good. just to be very. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Ready for the I think we're ready. Okay. Uh, Simon. Yes. Dahl. Yes. Arnson. Yes. Finnegan. Yes. Milbars. Yes. Fox. Yes. Montgomery. Yes. Silva. Yes. It's unanimous. So uh, then, for the direct for the duration of the meeting and all future meetings, the chair will vote. All right, fantastic, thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and move on to item 12D, um, limiting the number of agenda items that a single board member can propose for a meeting. Uh, this comes from our March 5th meeting. Um, member Hoffs moved to propose an April meeting agenda item to discuss limiting the number of future agenda items that can be proposed by a single board member 
the uh, Mr. Finnegan second in the motion. Uh, members Echo Hawk, Finnegan, Hops, and Pilgrim voted in favor. Uh, Aronson, Montgomery, and Simon voted against. Ms. Govars was absent and the motion passed. Um, so I guess um, we're maybe some clarification. We're at the stage where we're deciding on uh, what that number would be. Is that? I think we're getting some clarification of what the city council process was of of how many how members how like can you just have ten things you want right. to bring or does it a diversity yeah, of the so, group? So giving some kind of bumpers on this or motion. what the other board's policy is okay. like what, like in planning push like can can you put twenty items on the agenda or do we need to have enough consensus like a co sponsor like right. other like I'm coming from the government side so yeah we need co sponsors to have things. Be on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. I can clarify on the city council side, we don't have a an official policy for the council as far as official agenda items. However, in their organizational meeting, the council decided amongst themselves that it would be most effective to limit any member to two additional agenda items per meeting. And if they were Adding at every single meeting, they wanted a rotation. So if I added two agenda items, another counselor should be able to add. And you know, I wait and sit to make sure everybody has been addressed before I, I go again. So so it was more of a informal agreement to ensure we're not overloading staff and if we uh, and we're respectful of other council members, where you're not hogging the staff resources. So in addition to that, the city council did also decide if there's something that's going to take significant staff time and resource, that they do request a four hands vote. So if it's just, I need some more information or we want you to follow up on something, that's a pretty informal process. But if it's to do a full analysis of some, some request that's going to take significant time and resource, they do ask for a four hands vote. And it's very much just been something they agreed upon at their work. Um, so in this case, um, I mean, I, I think that sounds reasonable. Is there anything that we need to do as a as a board? Is it just uh, I don't know if we need an additional motion. It's just kind of an agreement that that's if that's what we want to adopt. I would recommend that if there are processes that you all want to have as a board, um, you do adopt them through a motion. So just like this, allowing the uh, chair to vote. That's something that we can track as staff on these are the rules of our particular library advisory board. And I don't know if rules is the right word for, for, for guidelines, guidelines yeah. <laughs> that we've agreed upon. So on this date, we agreed that the chair would vote. On this date, we agreed that new items will be limited to whatever you just said. I know, Pat, you provided a sample form. Yes, the board last. And I think the, the board agreed agreed to that um, uh, agenda item request and um, so we have used it um, for this meeting so we could add yeah. that to those guidelines sure absolutely and then if there's something you want to say is you know in order to I'll have to type it out before I talk but in order to ensure equal representation of all board members on future agenda items we agree that we will limit to up to two items per meeting or allow a equal rotation of those items, whatever whatever guidelines you consider. But whatever you do do, I would recommend it be in motion so we can add that to the guidelines and it's a guiding document for the board. Okay. Would anybody like to make a motion? Sure. I would like to make a motion to adopt similar guidelines to the city council that we limit to two new items for agenda um, and to order to have diversity in everyone represented. Okay. Can I make a quick, um, can we just add in two okay. items on agenda per member? Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nope. Two items yeah. on the agenda. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I guess that was really, really harsh. <laughs> I don't that time limit anymore. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Motion. Uh, and it is that uh, for um, for procedural purposes to say to match the city council. Is that sufficient for it to work? Okay. All right. We can draft something, and then 
maybe it's a good idea to bring forth guidelines at your next meeting and say, mm -hmm. is this, are we on the same page? Right. What does that look like to everybody? Okay. All right. Motion. Uh, can, do I hear a second? Okay, motion dies without a, uh, without a second. And so is there any other discussion on this item? Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to make a comment um, because I agree with Ms. Hopps. Uh, my hope is that the adults sitting or and the, 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 the caring people who are sitting around this table um, are cognizant of the fact that we don't wanna be monopolizing um, agenda items seem so far in my limited time here. It's been pretty respectful and I wouldn't want to limit somebody to bring an issue forward that needs to be addressed in a timely manner. Um, and so that's the only reason why I didn't, I didn't second it. I think that if it becomes an issue, then it would make sense to, to make a motion or to put a policy in place at that point. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then we'll go ahead and move on to item 12E. Uh, creating a work group to propose changes in the library collection development policy from the March 5th meeting. Um, and this is from Manager Walsh's February 7th memo. If, if you, being the Library Advisory Board, form an official subcommittee, uh, that committee makeup defines a new committee count. Therefore, any participation of two or more members working with staff does require a public meeting that is properly noticed. Uh, so that that uh, is the... Um, uh, Open Meetings Act. Uh, your your options are uh, one, select just one library advisory board member to work with staff, or two, ensure all subcommittee meetings are properly noticed and open to the public. Um, and so, uh, it is at at its or open to the public at its April twelfth meeting. The board will consider setting up a work group to propose changes to library advisory committee. So library. Library collection development policy. Uh, so we have two options provided to us. Uh, any discussion on this item? Yes, I have, a, I have a question for staff. Sure. Um, is there already like a game plan to review the collection development policy? Is there already a timeline for that? Um, uh, yes, definitely. And what's happened over the past probably at least three meetings, mm -hmm. is the board has been going through and making recommendations and voting on motions and that kind of thing. And I believe that last paragraph of the uh, resource placement uh, section was the last um, uh, recommendation that we can put. And so um, my proposal, my plan would be to, uh, for the, um, library staff, uh, a subcommittee of library staff to get together to review this, um, to uh, make a determination about what um, we have questions about, what we feel are um, appropriate changes, and then bringing um, that back to the advisory board um, with an explanation if there are things that we um, uh, decide not to include in the policy with an explanation of why we decided not to policy. Uh, and then I think, I believe, that the council would be also interested in this. And uh, so um, this would also go to council as well. Um, so that that is my thoughts, is that we would look at this proposed changes to policy, uh, we would bring that to you, and then it would eventually go to council. Makes sense to me, thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Question. Um, was, and obviously Mr. Finnegan can answer this, what was the plan? Last I heard from the council, obviously there's been a turnover in the council, so maybe that's changed, that they weren't going to consider it until the library advisory board did, we did. Does it go to them or does it go back to the library instead of to them? Uh, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm... <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to ask you for an assist on that because I'm just, I'm not sure. The direction of the council is they would like to review the policy once it's finalized by the library advisory board. So they didn't have any comments as far as we want to see A, B, or C. It was once it's complete, we'd like to review it. So does that mean this goes to them or does it go back to the library and then to them? That's no. I'm just wondering. When, once the policy is finalized, then it would go to council. 
So whatever that making of the sausage looks like between the, you, if you decide to have a subcommittee to work on it separately, um, or if you decide to do it as a board. So whatever that final policy is that the library adopts, that would go to council for review. The library or the library advisory board? That's what I'm, I'm just looking for clarification. Because it did we vote? Did, am, am I not remembering correctly? We've now voted as a board on the policy? Or is it not because we're an advisory board, does the library have to stamp that before we before it goes? The last and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, is you all did make changes to the policy. There were a few items that you wanted further discussion and that was what was on pause. Is that correct? Well, my my understanding of this is that since the library advisory board is advisory, that the, that um, you all voted on recommended changes to the policy, and um, that my understanding is that these recommended changes um, would would be recommended to the library. Um, uh, that we would review the changes that you've recommended. Uh, and um, uh, adopt um, adopt those changes or have questions about those changes, bring uh, that policy back to you um, with explanations if we decide that there are some recommendations that, that we're not um, accepting. And then um, then after that, it would go to the council. But that yeah. would be mine. And, and that's correct. So, you know, Pat's not going to just say, these are the recommendations. No, no, no. Too bad. This right. is how we're going to move on. She's right. going to look at those. Serious. And and if there are questions or maybe clarifications, then she would come back to you and say, this is why we can't add it, or this is why we don't recommend this language, and, and have that discussion until we reach that consensus. Just I have a question. Um, just for clarification, um, this uh, I do see a lot of the recommendations that we started with in October, which mm -hmm. was a lot, um, are in here. And then uh, the January meeting, we had um, the questions about the legalities and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so we just voted to put that in there. So this now is from October. This is basically done with the recommendations that we had. Mm -hmm. But we did also just discuss the proportions. So are you going to redo that now? Or is that going to yes. be at October when how we agreed to every October redo it? No, um, you're going to add that to right. this one before it goes to council. Yeah. Okay. We're going to yeah. So the the um, librarians, our subcommittee, uh, may find things in here that we think uh, doesn't work anymore. Um, so we may make additional changes, and we'll we'll flag those. So okay. you'll know in addition to the recommendations you've made that we've adopted, there are additional changes that. Uh, we're making in the policy, and this is why. Got it. But as far as what we have recommended, left over from the October meeting, the mm -hmm. original, mm -hmm. um, basically, we're, we're, we've wrapped that up now. Yes. Now we're just waiting on the, the new stuff. Right. So nothing is going to council yet. Right. Got it. I don't see the need for a subcommittee at this time uh, if, if the library staff has other changes to make. Just given the recommendations that we've already made, have been taken care of. I don't. I don't think that we need to form a subcommittee until there are new changes that uh, Miss Tully and her staff bring up, and then maybe if we have any objections to that, then we can form a subcommittee. But that's my two cents. It's like three cents. <laughs> Inflation. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? I would agree with you. Okay, uh, with no further comments, we'll go ahead and move on to new business. Item 13A, uh, for discussion on recommendation, on, I'm sorry, for discussion and recommendation regarding a request to move copies of a book from the children's and teen collection to the adult collection this one summer by Jillian and Mariko Tamaki. Uh, so, any discussion um, on this topic? I guess, do we need to go straight to a motion? To open up discussion? I believe we do, yeah. Yeah, so do, uh, is there a motion? Is, would anybody like to make a motion on this topic? 
I think your motion would be to appeal the library director's decision to retain this one summer in the teen section of the library. Okay. Would anybody like to make that motion? Um, no. It's also in the children's section. Yeah, I so, have. It, so, I'll make a motion. I move that we. Uh, uh, oh, I don't know now. That <laughs> <laughs> was so good. Appeal. To appeal. To recommend appealing okay. the library director's decision to retain this one summer. I move to appeal the library director's recommendation to retain this one summer in its current location. It's in two um, locations. Here. Second. Okay. <laughs> um, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. I was just um, interested to know um, from the comments that were made, is there more than one copy of this book in the library? And and where are is the book actually located? Yes, there are two copies of this book in the library. There's one copy in the children's um, uh, graphic novel section, and there's one copy in the teen section. Um, I... I appreciated all the comments, if I could. Mm -hmm. I appreciated the comments um, that were made today. I'm struggling a lot um, with how, how this. And so I, I wrote down a couple things that I wanted to share um, based on some of the comments that were made today. And so uh, we shouldn't be afraid of moving a book is one of the comments I heard. And also the fact that this is about analyzing our community standards. Uh, I have to say, cause I haven't said it before. I, I was nine years old reading the client by John Grisham. So the fact that the information is available is not my concern. The fact that parents are not getting the opportunity and, and whatever you want to argue, yes, I know all of the stuff that we've talked about, okay? It's my responsibility for my kid. I totally get that. But based on all of the things that I have heard, I cannot in good conscience, conscience with just have my kids have free reign at the library because I know that they're not going to limit what could potentially be inappropriate or damaging information for my child. Is it their job? Nope, not necessarily, but... It is funded by taxpayer dollars. And we do have a community standard that we're trying to uphold. So uh, whether or not the book is appropriate for teens really is subjective to the parent, the individual, that individual child's individual parent. And that's a subjective choice. So when we make a determination to say, we're just going to leave it when we have community, the community citizens coming forward and saying, I'm concerned about the appropriateness of this material. I, I don't, I don't see how that uh, uplifts, you know, the, the goals, right. Uh, that we're serving the, the entire Ketchikan community. If we're allowing access to information that could be inappropriate and with all the laws and the rules and the way that they, have things set up, it is even more subjective, right? So did you get it from the public library or did you get it from the school library, right? I heard a one comment um, that uh, it seemed like it would be more appropriate for this book to be in a high school library, not in the teen library of the public building. And I, and I so that spoke to me um, just because it's a good story, you know, uh, doesn't mean that everybody should have access to it. Um, I don't think that this is a form of banning books by moving it to the adult section. They still have the ability to get those books. And it is a little concerning to me that there are those that believe that if it's in the adult section, it's harder for them to get because I haven't heard that from anybody. I haven't heard that situation, that experience from anybody. Um, do they feel less protected in the adult section? I, I, I don't know. I mean, like that would, I, I'd be curious to have those conversations and hear from our teens more about them. So I really also appreciate having those surveys and that insight. Um, so 
for those reasons, um, I would I would support, uh, and I'm very concerned that this book is available in the children's section. So for those reasons, I would support um, appealing the decision and then having that book available in in the adult section. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure. Could I have the motion reread? Let's see, the, um, the motion is to recommend uh, an appeal uh, to the library director's decision to uh, keep this one summer in the children's and teen section. And you made the motion? Mm -hmm. uh, would you consider a friendly amendment to have both copies in the teen section? I would not. I think you would split the question. Is that correct? You want to split it into two different areas. Do that. You can split the question to let's first consider the location from the children's section and then let's next consider the location in the teen section. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so I would make a motion now. Yes, you'd make a request to split the question and then you would vote on whether or not to split it. <laughs> Glad this didn't come up under my <laughs> Um Yes. I request that we split the motion. Okay. Um, we'll second that. Okay. Um, we'll take a vote. Yeah. Then. Oh, we'll take a vote. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah, good. Okay. Let's go ahead and pause for just a moment. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we just had a motion and a second to split the question. Mm -hmm. um, so any. Uh, so now um, we're ready for the vote on the on that motion. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, Arnton. No. Okay. Echo Hawk. Yes. Finnegan. Yes. Govart. Yes. Hops. No. Montgomery. Yes. Pilgrim. Sorry, could I get some clarification on which we separated it into two? No, you're just voting, voting on. Voting Do you want to separate it? Oh, okay. Yes. Simon. No. Dahl. Yes. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six to three um, in favor of splitting the motion. Okay. Thank you. Um, so then we'll uh, move to, so we're back to the, really the original motion, but we'll start with the children's section. Um, so regarding this book um, in the children's section um, this one summer to appeal the city manager's decision and I'm sorry city, our library director library director's decision mm -hmm. um, to keep it where it's at okay mm -hmm. and then the motion is would be to to move it to the adult section or just okay well, I don't know well, she I did this oh actually that has not been established you're right okay so just to appeal the Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm caught up. So yes, let's go first. I have a couple of questions for the director. Sure. Um, can you? I'm a bit um, embarrassed to say that I do not know where the graphic novel section is of either the children's room or the teen. Can you kind of direct me where in the children's room is that graphic novel section? In the children's room, it is uh, back by the windows um, that are kind of facing. Um, the Bear Valley, mm -hmm. you know, facing Deer Mountain. Okay. Um, so it's kind of that last uh, section of stacks that are facing the window and facing the, we call it the tween area um, uh, because it's for um, kids like from 10 to 12 um, who don't want to be like in the, in the younger children section. Um, but uh, that's where it is. So you're aging, it sounds like the, the children's room is kind of zero to 12, yep. give or take, and then the right. teen room is 13, 13 to 90. 90. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then specifically on that kind of side of the, the deer mountain side mm -hmm. in that nook, that's the tween side. It's kind of the tw tween side, not so much, but not so much for collections as for the kind of a place to sit and um, that kind of thing. So okay. um, the Children's graphic novel are for children and teens. And tweens, sorry. Okay. 
Yes, Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, hypothetically, if the if this one summer was to be moved to the adult section, how would it be categorized? Do you have an adult graphic novel section? We do. So it would be, it would be moved there most likely. Yes, because it is definitely a graphic novel. Um, are there other books in the children's section in that graphic novel area um, at the same level as this particular book? And I'm speaking specifically of the language and the subject matter. Are there I'm similar not familiar books? Enough. Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the um, graphic novel um, section um, to know, but I would imagine it would uh, have a variety of uh, graphic novels for a variety of ages all the way up to 12. And this one summer is definitely kind of on the border between tween and teen. Uh, and uh, yeah, we feel pretty comfortable having it in the children's section. Could I address a question to Ms. Toffler? Sure. Yep, absolutely. Uh, could you answer that question? Is this book the only one in that section that is uh, that, that graphic? Um, there are multiple stories. Look all the way from ghosts to um, I want to say one of uh, Raina tele tel telegrammers. Um, she writes um, some that are in that tween age group that have these same uh, kind of themes running through them. Um, it, it's not necessarily a full coming to age story, but you also find like Lumberjanes has a lot of that same theme work in them. Um, now, down to exact language, I couldn't give you exact, but there are definitely graphic novels that fit in that vein um, of where the publishers have put it from ages 12 up to 14. So we're kind of in that really tween, young teen range for interest. Um, when I went to the library the other day to get this book, it was not in the teen section. It had been checked out, so I had to go to the children's section to get this book. And I sat down on my couch while my son was at preschool and my other son was napping, and I read this book front to back. And I have, let me tell you, I have experienced in one way or another 100% of everything that has happened in this book. Uh, the biggest thing... <laughs> that uh, the biggest issue I have with it is um, none of that stuff that I experienced is applicable to children, in my opinion. Um, I, the youngest girl in the book, um, Wendy, when she starts talking about, you said it first, boobs, um, she's starting puberty. And when you start going through puberty, these prepubescent teens or tweens, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're going to be looking for books and they're going to be looking for information. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to want to find this book in between Scooby-Doo and the Haunted Hollows and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles go to school. They're going to be looking for this book in the graphic novel section, in the teen section. Any kids that are starting puberty don't want to be associated with the big cloth covered tree and the puppet books hanging on the end of the aisles. They're going to want to, you know, find these books that have these experiences and things that they're going to relate to, uh, you know, growing up through their teen years in either the graphic novel section of the teen room or even, um, like Sophia mentioned earlier, having to go out, it might have been you, or another, might have been the tall gal that mentioned it, going to the adult section to find these people, kids, anybody that has to go to the adult section is going to know that the subject matter that they are going to find in that section is going to be more mature than what they find in the children's section or the teen section. Um, when I looked it up online, all of the age groups for this book was, it was either uh, 12 to 18 years was the reading level or eighth grade plus. To me, none of that applies to the children's room, which you have said now is zero to 12. It's uh, the the F-bombs, the, the name calling with the, I'm not going to say it because there's children present. I don't feel comfortable saying those words in front of your kids. You probably don't read want the your, book. What? They've read the book. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> <You're different. laughs> um, but I mean, I wouldn't say that in front of your kids. It's, I appreciate you know, that. You know, it's just, it's just, it's not 
to me, it's not right. And so having this book in the kids section, if kids want to read that kind of stuff, I 100% agree that it applies to teens. It should be in the teen section. That's fine, but not in the children's section. It's not for their age group. It's not for a four-year-old to pick up, an, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, any of these kids that can read. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be able to find it unless they are actively seeking this kind of information that they can find either in the teen room or the adult section. That's my two cents. Can I make a comment? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the book does deserve a place in the teen room. I can understand the questioning behind it being in the children's room. My biggest thought behind almost all of these books really is if we're if we're worried about a kid coming and picking up, say four, five, six, to twelve, um, I guess I really think about where parental supervision comes into that. Um, I know me personally, my parents before I could check out a book, they would read the book, or maybe not all of it, but they would skim it. They would check it. They would look online reviews. Um, they would they would want to know what the book was about before I read it, and then when I turned about. I was seventh grade, really, and I had to library at our middle school. They said, you know, we think you're ready to have these topics. And it's again, it's different for every child, um, different for every family. But I think that if you were worried about a four year old stumbling and grabbing this book and seeing this, the F word, I, I think more of like, is there a four year old that goes to the library alone? Um, do, do parents kind of go with them and say, oh, you know, we're not going to read this book. Um, and then if it's like a 12 year old that's sitting there and then reading it, um, they don't necessarily have to check it out. They don't, the parents don't have to see that they've checked it out. They could just pick it up and start reading it. So I can see, you know, maybe a 12 year old who's waiting there until their parents get off work, just hanging at the library, picks it up. The parent doesn't want them to read stuff like that, but they haven't checked it out. So there's not like a line of being able to stop them. I can see where that might be, you know, so we shouldn't have it in the children's library. I can understand that point of view, but I do think it deserves a place in the teen room. And I, looking at this survey, I think there was one quote, if I could be allowed to read something from here. Oh, right here. Please don't remove slash move any books about harsh or deeper topics because you don't think we are ready for them or don't understand them. We do. Most teens are smart and so emotionally intelligent. If you would take the time to see this, you would know that stories involving grief, family problems, and mental health struggles are important to have for teens or to, important to have available for teens. Uh, it's on page five at the very bottom of the page. So I think that that quote, it came from, I think, a junior. If that's what it said. It, it kind of just point blank says, please don't move deeper topics, family problems, grief, mental health topics out of the teen room because you don't think that we're ready or you don't think that those topics are appropriate. Um, so I, I would understand the children's section because that's a little bit different. That is a different age range, but in the teen room, I do think it deserves a place. And I think that that's supported by at least the people who responded to this survey. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Hanna. Trying to say it carefully. I hope we're all listening to what's being said because I hear in the same breath, sometimes out of the same mouths, it's not appropriate, but it is appropriate. I'm, I am, I'm deeply disturbed as I hope every adult is, that people continually label teens as independent adults. Teens are minors. And if we're concerned about something in a child's hands, because of some issue, and we're not concerned about it in the hands of a teen, I'd like to know why. Because there are no standards, apparently. Uh, it's the parents who are supposed to have that discussion, but the parents don't get to know what's in 
the book. As a matter of fact, the parents don't even get to know the kids check out the book. But yet they're the ones who are responsible, but only for the children, not for the teens. I, I really hope that we are listening to ourselves because if we're going to say, and I'm fine with saying, that a child, this book does not belong, belong in the hands of a child, it doesn't belong in the hands of a teen either. It belongs in the hands of the parent who makes that decision. And if this circumvents the parent for a child, it's circumventing the parents for all minors. That said, because we're talking about it as children, I do have a question for Steph, if I can ask. Sure. Uh, Ms. Tupfer, because it was from your letter, um, just to clarify, you had said, and I want to get it in the right place. Um, it is, you know, I'm just going to go to your letter because I don't want to get it in the wrong place. That, there we go. Uh, to address your concerns about language in the book, many young adult authors write in the current teenage vernacular. While some readers will find this off-putting, this is considered an accurate representation of what many teenagers hear, speak, and face within their lives. Since we're talking about his children, how does that paragraph apply to tw tweens, I guess? Um, I'll walk through the halls of show and art. And I think it would answer your question. I hear I in show bar. I visit show bar, um, and I hear those words very freely spoken among show bar children. Um, I hear it within my tween group that we have at the library. And you have to go, okay, hey guys, you got to keep it down to PG. These are not uncommon words for these kids to hear. It's so, a vernacular that is readily available for them to hear and use. And while it might not fit one family, it might be fine for another family. And knowing that this book is in the hands of zero to 12 in that room doesn't make a difference? Well, I would highly doubt a if, if baby I... would pick up that book just because. Well, regardless of that, I mean, my question is, would you say the same about zero to 12 since this is available in the room to zero to 12? I have to look at the whole age group. So yes, I would say that for that upper end of that age group, yes, it is the current vernacular for that upper end of the age group. Thank you. Um, I have a problem with, first of all, what tweens are. I looked all over the place and I found so many different things. I actually ended up in a book, and I didn't have access to the whole thing, just a preview, but it was a book about creating and curating tween books for a library. And it even said there was no agreement whatsoever. It was varied all over the place. I find everything, and I'm seriously looked everywhere, from family sites to parenting sites to legal dictionaries, everything went literally from six to 12 for a tween. And as a parent of children who could read at that age and as a trained, experienced educator of gifted and twice exceptional children, they can read this and they cannot understand it. They'll ask questions and here's how I know. I have experienced too. And they've asked me. And yeah, they can read these words and they can read what, what the subjects are in here. There, I've, there are a lot of things that I can say about this book in the hands of children 
if I Honestly, all you have to do is just look at these quotes. I don't even have to read them out loud. This book has no business in the hands of my children. Notice I said my children. It is in the hands of my children, just like it's in the hands of everyone's child. So I would make this decision for my child. If I could, I can't. It's in the room for zero to 12. Well, I, I would like to remind the board that that is, that is the motion on the table. So if, if we would like to um, make, you know, the motion is whether or not we want to uh, repeal that decision and move it out of the children's area, that's what we're discussing. So if you have strong feelings about it, great. You know, we, then we, we make the vote, we make that decision. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, from what I, I personally think that um, that I'm more comfortable with it in the teen section than in the children's section, uh, and um, and I will support I will support this motion. Uh, any other comments? Can I make a comment? Of course. Um, I want to go about this in the most polite way I can, um, but while teens are considered minors, while we are minors. There is a large, undeniable difference between a six-year-old and a 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old. Um, my ten or my nine-year-old brother in the third grade does not have the same comprehension level as me. And that is just a fact. Um, I don't think that we can say that we can group children ages 0 to 12 in the same group as teens. I just don't think that we can because just for example, freshman English classes at K-High, the books that are used in curriculum include racial slurs um, of mice and men. I Just for an example, um, we have talks of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, the House on Mango Street, uh, that's the example. Um, there are these books that are at comprehension level for freshmen, but we would not give them to, say, a fourth grader, because that is not the same level. And you cannot put them side by side and say, this book should not go to either of them, because to a fourth grader, it's not okay, but to maybe a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, it is okay. I don't feel like we can be grouped together. Um, and I think that that should be understood that teens and ch elementary school children and high schoolers are not at the same comprehension level. Um, and that there is a, there is a big difference in that. And the books that go along with that are s subsequent. Um, you don't see books with, or you don't see picture books with four or five words on them per se in the teen section, because that's not what teens read. Teens have a comprehension level higher than that. Just as you would not find just paragraphs and paragraphs of writing per se to a four and a five year old, because, you know, maybe that's not exactly this, it's not comparable. Um, and I think that that should be noted when making a decision about one's in the children's room ages zero to 12 and one is in the teen room 13 and older. Thank you. And just real quick, I do want to just clarify on the time. Did Thank you. We, get, uh, we did call for a 9 p.m. stop time, correct? That yes, 9 then p.m. anything beyond that would go to the next meeting mm -mm. or a special meeting two weeks. Oh, yeah, what, what was it? Yeah, what, what was it? I think the, it was at 9 p.m. Uh, determination whether we would go on and complete. That's right. It was a termination. Yes. Okay, that's right. So, uh, so we are, majority. yeah, we are getting pretty close. We have 14 minutes left. Um, I believe that, that I, most everybody has said their piece. Is, is there anybody else I'd like to chime in on this motion? Um, now, the motion right now speaks to moving both books in no, the one no, in the No, it was just the children. Just the children, because we split yeah. the question. We split, yeah. Okay. So, so the motion on the table is to repeal the director's decision to keep the book where it's at specific to the children's section. 
Okay. Right. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think this is terrible to talk about. It's a lot of personal information. But um, in elementary school, we had a girl who started her period at age nine, and that was unheard of. And during checkups with my pediatrician for my kids and their peers checking with other parents, a lot of the girls on this island have started by age 10, and that's normal. And coming to the realization that kids are going through puberty earlier, their body is changing earlier, their peers are having different conversations at a younger age than I experienced. Um, my kids have read every single book in the graphic novel section of the children's library section. And they've read this one. And my daughter just asked if she could talk, but I will add her points in. And that she has come into contact with some older kids through various groups and clubs and organizations, and they have different language than she's experienced, different language that we use at home and talk about different things in different ways. And Sophia hit on it earlier is that they have questions, they're gonna be exposed to it. And these are times where you can say your older brother, your older sister are having these conversations or using these words and you should not, and here's why. These are moments for education and I would love to protect and isolate them from all of the terrible things that happened in this book. And one of the things that really stuck out was the grief of the parents of through the child loss. And I don't think there's any other book in the, in the children's section that talk about child loss and what it's like for the parents because the kids are part of that family and part of that experience and they are not talked about at all in anything. And I thought that was a unique perspective of why this book was important. It's from a tween perspective. It's from a 12 year old. It's from a kid about to be a teenager. They're not to the teen room yet. They are still starting their journey through puberty and they are exposed to these things and these are all good things that we can have educational moments with our kids and talk to them about before they're teenagers and it's happening to their peers. And that's just my piece. Thank you. And, uh, and if I may clarify, that was input directly from your daughter? Yeah, yeah. she has thoughts. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I think we're ready. And uh, so I will start with Echo Hawk. No. Can I clarify the? Yeah. Oh, the motion. I understand the motion, but what a yes means versus what a no means in this instance. Um, so the motion was to recommend appealing the library director's decision. Mm -hmm. So a yay vote would be yes. We would like to appeal the public library um, library director's decision to retain the book in the shelf. Thank you. So yes is to take it out of the children's room, no is to keep it. Right. We recommend. Okay. Uh then again. No. Go of ours. No. Ops. No. Montgomery. Yes. Dolbrum. No. Simon. Yes. Dahl. No. Arnson. Yes. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six to three um, to not appeal the public library director's decision. Great, thank you. And so we roll right into the to the next motion, which is to repeal the library director's decision specific to this book in the teen section. Um, so any, again, we are on a time crunch, so we have nine minutes left. Um, I believe we probably have discussed a, a lot of it already, but is there anybody else that would like to add comments to this? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm so old, we didn't have middle school. We had junior high. So we, 12 year old seventh graders didn't know anything. And so we relied on each other. You know, they didn't know anything either. Uh, for example, the F word, we didn't know what that meant, but someone said, yeah, my cousin told me that during the last war, now we're talking World War II or Korea, that the, the enemy troops were here in the United States and they would take pregnant women and remove the babies from their stomachs. And that's what the F word meant. So we were just out there without a paddle. Um, but we were dealing with teen pregnancy, um, getting boobs, and then some of the issues that were brought up in this book, miscarriage, depression. It was probably around us, but we had no clue. 
if I had a 12 year old daughter or granddaughter not right now, I'd set her down and make her read this book. And then we talk about it at length, probably more than once, because these are things kids need to know about. I remember girls getting pregnant in high school. They were shunned. Uh, they probably dropped out and that was the end of their education. Uh, they were probably looking at poverty. And like in this book where, you know, the girl was shunned, uh, but the boy was like, Pit, not my kid, must be somebody else's. You know, uh, girls need to know that that's that. Happens. So I, I do believe that book is very appropriate for the TNL. Yes, ma'am. We're making this the decision not for ourselves not making it for our children, not making it for what we believe. This is supposedly about the entire community. So I reiterate what I said at the beginning, just because person A thinks something doesn't mean that person B thinks that same thing. So when you put this book in a teen room, you put it in the hands of every teen and you say that every teen gets this book, not their parents have to make the decision. You don't let their parents make the decision. The library has already said it will hide that fact from the parents. Parents can't make that decision. As a matter of fact, if you look in the catalog, even Lamer's description hasn't been updated yet. And when I hear that we that uh, teens get these books, books like this with themes like this in um, school, I'm a high school English teacher. And I don't let those children read those books simply all by themselves. The Color Purple, any of these books, they're handed out and discussed. We even heard that. Give it to the child and discuss it. This isn't giving it to them and discussing it. This is giving it to them. Any comments? No, I think we're ready for the question. Sue so Finnegan. No. Bill Bars. No. Ops. No. Montgomery. No. Silver. No. Simon. Yes. Dahl. No. Arnson. Yes. Echohawk. No. So that seven to two, uh, not to uh, recommend an appeal. Thank you. Okay, so it is. If we do have one other agenda item, it is the. Your Honor. Oh, yes, ma'am. If I could just go ahead and make a motion that we extend the meeting to nine thirty. Okay. I second. All right. Perfect. Motion made and seconded. Um, go ahead, and we can go right to the vote. Okay, let's see here. Let me start at random. Um, Dovars. Yes. Ops. Yes. Montgomery. Yeah. Dovar. Yeah. Simon. Yes. Dahl. Yes. Arnson. Yes. Echo Hawk. Yes. Finian. Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. to go to nine thirty. Thank you. So we're on item thirteen B, resource rating system for minors. Do we have a motion? Um, I would like to make a motion. Um, I would like I would like to ask for um, for hands direction for staff because um, I'm curious. I've done a little bit of research and I haven't and I found a little bit, but it's not enough, and I just haven't done enough time to figure out if there is any kind of objective rating 
system so that a wheel wouldn't have to be reinvented. In prior conversations and in research, it looks like there isn't, but I'm not sure. And so I was curious to know if we could get a report from staff to know what kind of uh, criteria or measuring systems are out there to assess book content. Uh, if any. If any. Officer, ask them a forehand direction. Yeah, to, I'm just to asking them to direct those staff resources. Direct staff resources. And start researching that. We have been. So that's why Pat added the other. Right. <laughs> so just curious, I guess, uh, just to get a, a I just have that expectation of a report coming back to us about what, what they discovered. But I don't think that there's any other. Right. Tell them to go create a new rating system, you know, in a, in a quarter or whatever. So. And that would be helpful if the board member who's suggesting this would actually give us a sample of what they've got. There's. Yeah. Apes. On the website of Comics Plus, all you got to do is look there. Yeah, so, but that that would be great direction to staff instead of saying, you know, go out in the ether and figure it out for yourself. But it would direction you provide to us sure. is incredibly helpful. All right. Um, so then, um, where we're at is asking a forehand direction to have staff try to com uh, compile some information with recommendations from the board uh, and to present that back at a future date. Yeah, no recommendations from the board needed. I'm just curious to know what they find in regards to rating systems, if any. Okay. Right, right. And um, I think I would limit that to uh, libraries that have produced rating systems okay. um, because I think companies and organizations have different than the library. I think that's so if their rating true. systems are not um, applicable necessarily. Okay. I'm confused. Is this in lieu of anything else? What is well, um, if if the forehand direction passes, that'll be its own its own agenda. Agenda, yeah, its own item. Um, but there can be a motion made if there's if somebody has the desire to make a motion, and if it's seconded, then we'd have debate and discuss it. So, so but what's on the table right now is forehand direction right. on this specific item. And then, if you have a specific grading system, you'd like to make a motion to introduce then that could be another uh, motion if, if that's what you choose. But I would like to say that the, uh, the recommendation from staff is that we cater the direction to, to get resources that have been maybe created by a, an established library that has the same similar mission and serves, again, serves the community um, in the same way. So that's the recommendation from the staff. I, I hear that, Your Honor. Um, I would just like them to think outside of the box a little bit. So I don't know that I'd, I, my request isn't to be limited to that, okay. but I also wouldn't expect you to go check them to go check out like car rating systems and how do they label them, right? So so I, I want to be reasonable, um, but I, I sure. that's where I'm at okay. with that. So the question is for... fair to staff. Uh, request is for four hands, I believe, you know, the intent is, is included. Um, so, do we have four hands? Do we have to raise our hand? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, we have four hands. Okay. And you Thank can you. have more than four. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, four hands uh, to be, have this information brought back in the future agenda items. Um, and then, are there any other uh, motions specific to 13B? Question. Mm -hmm. The uh, agenda says board discussion. You said something about that before that discussion didn't require a motion. You can make a motion to discuss the future rating system. Okay. Yeah. And then, then that uh, enters you into just a discussion. It's not an action item, but it does come to the board to discuss. Then I would move that the board discuss a possibility of a rating. Um, you said something better than I'm going to say it. Just rating system. Rating system. That's the word. Thank you. And it for minors or and in general. For minors. Thank you. Second proposition. When I'm curious to know when this discussion will be right happening. now. Right, right now. Yeah, right now. Yeah. 
So we have a motion by Ms. Simon, second by Ms. Gobors. Uh, so now it's open for discussion. Would the maker of the motion like to start? Again, I didn't want to jump ahead of it. Oh, anything. sure. No, go ahead. Well, should we vote if it's for discussion? Oh. Yeah, because it's yeah, it's right now it's in discussion. Um, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. or do we need to vote? <laughs> it was a, mo a motion to discuss. It was a, it was a motion. We oh yeah, vote. you're right. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you guys make me feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> My brain stopped. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're voting on the motion to discuss. Uh, hops. Yeah. Montgomery. Sure. Pilgrim. Yes. Simon. Yes. Dahl. No. Arnton. No. Echo Hawk. No. Finnegan. No. Gobers. Yes. Four. Uh, so the nays have it. Okay. Um, so we have then under new business, we have then, um, I think that concludes the site. We have a, we have four hands and a motion to discuss has not passed. So I think we're ready to board member comments. Okay. All right. So I will go ahead and start with Ms. Gobors. Sure. Well, welcome chair. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Dalton, June, for your service to this board. Um, that's been pretty remarkable and uh, no small feat. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's lovely to see a full board, um, especially the team rep. Um, really cool to see all of us here. Um, and then a quick uh, congratulations to Kelly on her retirement. I'm sorry for your loss, but uh, congrats to Kelly for her uh, years of service. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Simon. I am very disappointed in a lot of people for different things, but when it comes to the well being of those that we as adults are entrusted to set off in life, that really hurts. I, my entire career has been teaching since I was in fifth grade. It, it is very disappointing to me that children are set off adrift, minors are set off adrift in a world that they can't make sense of. And the very people who know they can't make sense of it set them off. In the name of choice, the children and the, the minors don't get that choice. We make that choice for them. I hear a lot, well, they talk like this already, so just let them read it. Where did they learn to talk like that? And is it okay? Apparently it is because adults are making that decision for other adults. I hear that we, we'd love to have our children raised in a safe place, but we can't keep them safe. No, we can't. Can we? Much as we try. Well, I hope that the next time a book comes up, that it isn't a cookie cutter. Oh, they're, they're teens. They speak like this. But that the people making that decision do it understanding that just because another person disagrees with you doesn't mean that you're right and they're wrong. I also find it very disturbing that 
a government entity would hide from parents what their children are doing. I really find that disturbing. And I think a lot of people would if they even knew about it. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pilgrim? Um, just thank you for, all for being here. Um, I'm grateful that everyone everyone got to say what their uh, opinion was and that we got to move through this and come to a conclusion. Uh, congratulations to Kelly in her retirement. Um, uh, good luck to the librarians who are reorganizing the teen room. That's no small, small feat. Um, and thank you to all the board members for seeing the survey and hearing teens' voices on matters that teen voices really should be in. Um, and that's really it. Great, thank you. And thank you again for being here. Um, congratulations, Mr. Chair and Mrs. Vice Chair, Mrs. <laughs> Vice Chair. Um, and thank you, June, for all of your hard work. Um, you didn't move very far, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a lot I could say, but we agreed to go home at 930. So I will save it for the next one. Um, and um, that's all I got. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. What stops? Oh, um, you're going this way. Sure. Me for a loop. Yeah. <laughs> um, things up. Well, first, thank you, June, for your service. You're a veteran now. Um, Thank you guys for all the discussion. I really enjoy talking to you guys and hearing everyone's opinions. Um, these are really hard topics and we are all here because we love books and libraries and kids and we have different opinions and I love that we can progress through these agendas and all of these issues because they're getting really interesting and they're really good conversations. Um, thank you for all your patience while well, I have to Handle interruptions. Thank you. In general, sharing it. Ms. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone and uh, congratulations to the chair. And oh. uh, um, so I just I just took a couple notes um, and I'm just trying to see which ones I wanted to share here briefly. Um, I, I, I've learned in my time growing up in Ketchikan uh, a handful of things I'll just make a note of, which is can't please all the people all the time. And uh, if if you're there's a, an expression in my world of marketing and sales, right? If you're selling to everyone, you're selling to no one. So. Again, I'm just going to reiterate, I really appreciate the work on the development policy and the progress that, that happens to get that more clear and transparent to the public. Um, these, these kinds of, this kind of information being available to children without any consideration for um, parents in, in that what we discovered tonight is it's the law, the library can't share what you know what books those parents have given um, for me and I think other people in our community uh, the library becomes a not safe place and that makes me sad um, I grew up in the library and it was a safe place and I could go and I could get information and I could get books um, but if this is how the policies are going to be for the community standards then I, I, for me and my family, and I'm not, I don't want to get too much into, oh, it's all about me. Um, I, it just means that my kids no longer have the freedom to go there without an adult. And that bums me out for our kids. Because while we don't all agree, and I love diversity, and I love, I love all the differing opinions and the viewpoints, because um, that's how we get better. We don't all want to be the same. Um, but I, I do think I probably represent at least a section of the community that feels this way. And so then we're not achieving the goals. The library is not serving the Ketchikan community. Um, so how, how do we know that they are? 
So that's going to be the next thing that I'm going to be bringing up and asking about is uh, we, one of the other things I've learned is we talk about SMART goals, right? SMART is an acronym that stands for um, specific, measurable, attainable, re relevant, and time bound. So when we're dealing with this, the situation we're dealing with in our community and every single one of the people in this room and most of the people watching online are dealing with how do we wrestle with the policies? How do we honor the constitution and, and keep free speech and honor the fact that parents have rights and there are the ones who are ultimately responsible for their youth? Um, I, I think this board will continue to go in a good direction to, to make those policies for the community at large. But um, it would be nice to see from staff's point of view how, how they consider themselves successful uh, in their roles within the community. So with all those things being said, I will just say thank you again very much. And I really want to welcome Sophia. I really appreciate the, your ability to articulate yourself and communicate and gather that information and then bring it back to us in digestible bites. It's a really neat thing uh, that I Thank you for doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. I just want to echo some of the congratulations that have been issued to our new chair, to our former chair, to library employees past and present. And, um, and Sophia, I'm going to echo what Board Member Arnson was just saying, uh, to thank you for your participation, but also for going above and beyond with that survey that you created, which I think was just done under your own initiative. It's it's really insightful and it's helpful to get that kind of representation. So thanks for stepping to that task. I also want to thank the library staff for creating their, was it trash truck story time? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's the first one I took my little guy to because I felt like he was finally contained enough to be able to be in a group like that without being a total wreck. And it took him a minute to adjust. But he's got a new fascination now, and every time waste collection comes up our street, he's got to be watching. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, the guys on that truck, they're so good natured and amiable. They always give him a couple of honks. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, an, it was an awesome event. It was really great to be there. It was great to see other members of the city staff representing their department uh, in that fashion. It was a nice event. So thank you. Thank you. It's tall. It is so wonderful to see this table so full. It's I've never seen this many board members together at once. It's wonderful. But thanks to both of our new members for just starting off at a run. And uh, Sophia, it's so nice to have the information from the high schoolers. I really appreciate that. And um, that congratulations to both Kelly and Lisa. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is National Library Week, so be nice to your librarians this week. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, thanks everybody. I appreciate the discussion. I, I really um, enjoy the, the wide range of thoughts around these topics. Um, I do think that um, we do have to tackle some pretty important things. And I think that, uh, um, and I mentioned this the last time I was on the Library Advisory Board, that um, our librarians have the, one of the unique um, one of the unique professions where they can reach out and touch the First Amendment. You know, not all of us can do that. Not all of us have that kind of job where just by the nature of what they do, they are, they are, civil liberties are interwoven through their entire, their entire job. And I think that they've been navigating this with class, with dignity, and with tremendous service to our community. So I really appreciate all that you do. Um, I, I, from my perspective, a lot of the um, angst and um, discourse around libraries, even though they haven't changed, um, there's been a lot of attention nationwide over the last few years. And because um, I, I don't, I think that the, 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 the opinion from the city attorney whether this opinion came five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago would have been the same opinion. That, that what we, what we, what we uh, check out from our public libraries is our own business. It's always been our own business. And when we open up that door, and again, I'm speaking just on my own behalf, when we, I believe when we open up that door, um, it's too easy to push it open and access too much 
information. Um, if we open it for one person or one group of people, it's too easy. Um, and so that's my own personal thoughts on that. So I'm completely comfortable with keeping um, things like that confidential. But um, I, I do believe that when we do talk about democracy and about individual um, individual perspectives on things, is that it's different when we are when we're not taking anything away. And I believe that um, that a lot of our decisions um, have been to not take anything away, which is different than having access given to as many people as possible. Um, and I think we have to be really careful in that, um, that, that when we are thinking about taking something away, I think that's where it gets a little squidgy. So just, again, that's my own thoughts on this, but um, as, as a member now sitting at, as in the chair seat, uh, you don't have to call me your honor. <laughs> I really don't. That makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> so you're welcome to call your chair if you want to know who I'm talking to. Rant is fine too. <laughs> I'd like it doesn't. I don't think it needs to be this formal. The honorable right? Mr. Echo. No. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no. really As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to bring in an inflatable mallet because <laughs> this it's it, I don't think it needs to be this formal. And I do think that um, there's there's a portion of what we should be doing, which is kind of getting under the hood a little bit. But I but I don't want to have us do is spend so much time under the hood that we're not driving the library to some cool destinations. And I feel like over the last little bit, we've been digging so much under the hood uh, that. Uh, I don't know. We, I'd like us to think about what is what is something that we could really do to uh, create a, a, an environment, help the library be even uh, more amazing than what it is. Water bottles. Water bottles. Is <laughs> and, you know, new chess pieces and bouncy castles and, and zip lines, you know, the, the ceiling's high. Uh, so I think there's a lot of really great stuff that we could be doing. And I, 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 I really caution us to spend so much time digging around under the hood. Let, let staff and the city manager do what they do, do what they're trained to do. They know what they're doing. Give them, give them, the, um, give them the, the freedom to do it. Um, and I, I just on a, on a personal note, a lot of people don't know this about me, is I spent about a, a year and a half doing a, um, a just a trip. It was my job. It was my profession to, to do a deep dive into um, uh, children harm, harm that is done to children um, and specific around children's advocacy centers and um, and everything that goes into it, what 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 brings a child to a children's advocacy center, and uh, the things that I learned um, during this year and a half um, were some of the most horrific failures of policy, uh, failures of adults, failures of, of just the things that I know about what really happens um, is just horrific. And you can talk to organizations like the National Children's Association, which, which uh, provides support for children's advocacy centers. You can talk to law enforcement. You can talk to the Zero Abuse Project, which trains uh, uh, like members of law enforcement on, on properly um, doing interviews with children who are harmed. You can talk to all these other entities and organizations that their job is to protect children and their job is to create policy to, to provide these supports. And, and if, of all of the research and all of that I studied and everything that I dug into, there was not a single instance where the concern was that a child picked up a book from their library. And I just, I, I think that we, I, I truly believe that we need to keep things, keep things focused on what we really want to focus on, because I, I, I understand the concern. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I am a voting member and I want, I want you guys to know where my perspective's at, because I, I've done the research and um, it's, it's not library books. It's, it's so much more. Anyway, getting all emotional on this. Uh, and then the last thing, last point I want to make is, um, if none of you have had the opportunity to judge a DDF competition, um, these kiddos are smart. They're brilliant and they're sophisticated and they are incredible. And if you haven't, I highly recommend you go judge a DDF competition. That's debate, drama, and forensics, I believe. Uh, and if nothing, if if you if that doesn't open your eyes to the sophistication, the intellectual 
and social sophistication of these young people, um, then, uh, then I don't know what will, because they, they are taking on tackling topics, debating them, uh, presenting performances that, that at, every time I walk away, two things, I feel great about our future, and I always want them to run for office, <laughs> always. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need to give these young people credit. They're, they're brilliant, they're inspiring, and they, they, they know what they're doing. Um, so that's all my, I normally won't be this verbose. I just wanted to get all that out. So I appreciate everybody uh, and everybody's time. Thank you very much. Looking forward to us doing amazing things and helping out the community. So thank you. Thank you you still have a future. What the heck? <laughs> future agenda. I'm sorry. Yeah, now it's awkward. Oh, oh, now I know. <laughs> I, 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 really, I really ate up a bunch of time. <laughs> future agenda items. I'm sorry. Item 15. Are there any future agenda items? That haven't been discussed. That have not been right. discussed. Okay. Yes, ma'am. No. Yes, yeah. I would like, if it's not too much of a big deal, I'm not sure exactly what process your guys' staff goes through to make um, programs and like, you know, the things that you promote and all of that stuff around the library. Um, but uh, the um, Aquila Incorporated is uh, closing in Ketchikan, and they, they operate the car house and um, the, the Gateway Center for Human Services. Mm -hmm. um, I personally um, would like to see, um, if possible, um, the library do make more of an effort to promote and maybe even have programs um, with local professionals um, promoting mental health and other wellness activities um, throughout the summer for all residents um, and, and focus on that and be able to use our public resource of the library because, I mean, the information's there. You have the books, you have the space, you know, what, you know, let's make it uh, more visible for, for the people because, who, you know, there, there might be, be a time here where we're not going to have any of those resources in other buildings. So I, I would like to see if you guys could come up with something that um, would help catch a can in those areas. And this great. is a future agenda item? Um, yeah, I mean, if there's, I mean, if you wanted to do stuff in between now and then maybe just, you know, come up with some ideas or something and we can discuss it at the next meeting. Um, just I'll, I'll talk to the staff. Okay. I just want it on the brain because yeah. Yeah, we we it makes me sad. We really plan programs several months in advance. So, um, yeah, well, summer's coming. And so, you know, and so sunshine and happiness. Be better. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Good idea. Anything else? Okay, it's now me. <laughs> <laughs>